It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Jason Snell is here. Andy Anako's here. Alex Lindsay's here. And we are going to celebrate our 900th episode. Holy cow. Last episode of 2023. We'll talk about Beeper. We'll talk about those iPhones that shut down randomly at a Chicago holiday party and why it happened. We'll talk about the Adobe Figma acquisition. I guess it's all over. And a whole lot more, including why you won't be able to buy an Apple Watch in a couple of days. MacBreak Weekly is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 900, recorded Tuesday, December 19th, 2023. We'll work for eggnog. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Discourse, the online home for your community. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate anytime, anywhere. Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one month free on all self-serve plans. And by our friends at IT Pro TV, now called ACI Learning. Keep your IT team's skills up to date with the speed of technology. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners, you'll get up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discount is based on your team size, so fill out the form to find out how much you'll save. And by Secure My Email. Secure My Email provides easy encryption for your current personal and business email addresses. Setup only takes minutes, and you can start your free account or enjoy a 30-day free trial of a premium plan with no payment info required. And they have a special offer for Twit listeners to boot. Visit securemyemail.com slash twit and use the code twit at checkout. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show we cover the latest Apple news, our last show of 2023. It also happens to be episode 900. And uh, look who's here, our, the, the 900 Club. Uh, Jason <laughs> Snell, who's done probably 900 podcasts this year alone. Hi, Jason. Sure, Six but only colors. 100 of episodes of this podcast yes probably. So yes it's good to be here again nice to have happy you. 900 thank you to you and all the little mac breaks uh we are going to at the end of the show list everybody who's ever been on mac break weekly and then i think it'll go right through christmas andy anako wg birch in boston hello andrew merry jingle merry, merry Crimble, jingle. and merry 900th <laughs> thank you thank you thank you happy holidays uh, you have a little time because Orthodox Christmas comes late. That's usually my buffer zone where if there's so if there's something that I forgot or something that I want, like getting Christmas decorations up, I've got, I believe, a little bit of extra leeway because they're going to be staying up until like mid-January anyway. So <laughs> I'm jealous. That's Three awesome. cheers for Orthodoxy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Three cheers for Orthodoxy. Uh, and Alex Lindsay, who's an original, he's been here for many of the 900 episodes, an original Mac break. In fact, you invented Mac break. <laughs> it's good to be here. Yeah. I was looking at but Mac break one, Mac break weekly number one. So you, we did a video show for a while with you called Mac break. Yep. And I said, can yeah. we do an audio? And we did, we show? did, we did a Mac break weekly for a little while before you. And oh. then, and then we handed it, then I handed, I astutely handed it off to you knowing that it would do better. Uh, with mm. in inside of Twit than it would do with me. Well, we're, we're still and doing it, which is the biggest. You're still thing. <laughs> doing it. Look at all the other podcasts that I started. There's, there's, they, they all kind of faded away because I, I got busy. And, Pod and, fade and so, is and normal. What, it's the way of the world. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's been that first was episode I was uh, David Pogue, Amber MacArthur, Chris Breen, right. and Alex Lindsay. A look at Leopard and the new Mac Pro in the wake of WWDC. Amazing. And the next one was called So Sue Me, was hosted by you, Alex. Yeah, I think these were the early ones. So I guess the, 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 the early ones are the first ones. I think it was before you had started hosting. I'm not even here yet. Yeah, Scott Bourne hosting. is yeah. there. He was with us for a long time. Number three, Scott Bourne hosted with Jason Snell. Look at that, Jason. Look at that. Okay, I'm an OG then. You're an OG. OG. Chris <laughs> yeah, Breen Mac Break Weekly member. and Merlin Mann evaluating the Mac Pro new lithium-ion battery standards. Apple at Photokina. Will we see Aperture 2.0? Apple and oh boy, Apple and social networking. MacBook supply 32 gig flash what year based was that? Was iPod. That 2006? 2006. 2006. August 31st. Yeah, yeah we started in 2006. Number the, the first four. ones were all the first with the video one started the January of that year. Right. 
Um, and before that, it was actually Mac Break Minute. <laughs> some Mac Break Minutes that happened in 2005. I remember those minutes. I did a few of those, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then we, we, the, big, the first Mac Break video was with Amber MacArthur and... and uh, um, and you and I did I was I in it? And the guy who did it, Emery, and the, and the, and the Emery. billionaire Emery Wells. Yeah, exactly. Emery yeah. Wells. We did a, Elmer we did a bunch of those those Mac break videos. I remember coming over to the studio that was down on Market um, Street, south of south yep. of Market. Yeah. I, I think the first batch, and, and then the, and then the one down on Market Street where we would do like. It was like me and a bunch of other people from Macworld, and we just like kept on cycling through. Well, and you we did, did like five videos or well, you eight guys videos. Did, you guys were doing. Um, I still have that. I still have those videos somewhere. But I, I you guys <laughs> were doing the pics of the um, the Mac break winners. You guys came and did. You know, like we had a like you would talk about. You know, like the, the different winners for Mac Mac World. I'm sorry, Mac not Mac break Mac World winners for the Mac Mac World conference. You oh guys yeah, yeah, yeah. The best of show, through. right. Best that's of right. show. And we had a little graphic and had you guys I remember over that. top of it. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 I remember yeah. doing that. Yeah. So, yeah. That was, so we did that we did that and then and then some like Mac break segments I remember being like where we would like literally yeah. just step into a segment and, which is totally different than that was about the same era where we were doing all the stuff with um or just after we did the stuff with Tech TV. Call for I got into right. kind of a I got into so kind later. of mass production. Yeah. So I was like we would shoot like I think the very so first many. time we we I think our record was like 36 shows in one day. Yeah. Um, that and, sounds about right. You no, know, because it was like because we would just get in there. And, you know, you you would have your five minutes because all of our shows were like five minutes long or eight minutes long. If someone did twenty minutes long, we were like, we can't do all of them this way. Um, and so uh, and yeah, we produced a lot of them. But that's and then we got into the model and started doing it for other people. So Sal Segoyan was a regular. Yeah, uh, we had some good people. This is episode four. Scott Bourne hosted Kenji Cato, Chris Breen, Merlin Mann, and Ben Long. Ah, oh, I don't know where we nice. got these people. Ah, uh, finally, those, those on, good people. on episode five, we kind of settled into our regular panel uh, with Merlin, Scott, Alex, and me. That was, we did that for a long yeah. time. Brett Larson. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was Mac World, right? Oh, yeah. And he was yeah, also he Tech Mac TV, World. Chris Breen. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think the uh, Leo Laporte, Merlin Mann, Scott Bourne, Alex, Lindsay, that is yeah. OG Trinity. panel of yeah. uh, of Mac yeah. Greg Weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, here's one from uh, September twenty second, two thousand six. Title is the safe word is banana, with a non shimpy of a non tech. Then late, where did he go? Intel, and then Adam Apple Christensen. Apple. Apple, Adam Christensen from Tidbits, who's still doing his thing, and uh, Adam Knight. It you know, Adam. Adam. Actually, speaking of yeah, uh, the yeah. Mac Cast, which which was it just ended last week. Oh no. And that that was a show. He's going to be on um, Mac Geek Gab, I guess, over on that the Backbeat Network. But Adam, a little salute to Adam, did a podcast about the Mac from before. It, there are not that many of these, right? From before it was even in iTunes, before Apple got podcasting. So 2004, I want to say maybe for Adam, and he has been doing it since then until last week, and and then he wow. shut the Mac cast down, and it's going to go off. Just like you said, Leo, pod fade is real, and I think when people ask me about like how do I get into podcasting or blogging or video or whatever, I say number one is consistency. In the end, it's a grind, right. and you got to do it. Like if you're like you're really excited about it, and then you do like four of them, and you're like I'm tired, I'm bored, well, right? Like <laughs> consistency, showing your audience that you're committed and you're going to be there. Well, every I, week or other week or whatever I, your frequency is, is just key to the whole thing. I always tell, one, tell, tell everyone, um, write write the title for your first 20 episodes. Just <laughs> write the title for the first one. And they're oh, like, well, what so if you good. can only get five? You're like, if you can't get to 20, you're going to run out of room. Like, no. you're just going to run out of, you have to know yeah. where you're going to go. If you're filled with ennui at number 13, maybe don't do it. Is that right? Maybe Maybe <laughs> yeah. don't do it. A lot, a lot exactly. of people have opinions, have like five opinions. <laughs> and then when it comes to the sixth show, yeah, they're, they're like, like Okay. Well, clearly, I have at least nine hundred. Uh, so, <laughs> so having worked having worked in magazines back in the prehistoric era, as Andy knows, because Andy did too. Uh, one of the things that I remember talking to David Pogue about, I remember talking to John Dvorak about it, um, is the they you would have your your monthly columnist. Andy did this job too, right? And I remember somebody. When Dvorak was writing the back page column for PC Magazine and for Mac User, he was our anti-editor. He was like just <laughs> provocative and all of that. But what he did, uh, we always commented on like, John has five good columns a year. And then he's got 
four recycled columns a year and then three bad columns a year. And that was just 12 a year is all that was required. And I remember talking to Poke about it because I was his editor for a while when he was on the back page of Macworld. And it's the same thing. It's like, oh, 12 a year. It's so hard. And I think about it now because like when I started writing for Macworld.com <laughs> after I left Macworld, I was writing 52 of them a year. Wow. And but what I'm saying, though, is they can't all be gems, but being able to kind of like cycle through and grind and get the content out is part of being a pro. And uh, I think it that's was, fitting that it was hard. we're in if episode anything, 900 here. If, 900. If, any, if anything, having more at-bats at like makes it easier because you can take more risks. You can do things that are more fun. Whereas if it's like, I only have their attention for like five minutes once a month. This has to be exceptionally good. Right. And if you're thinking about, wow, that might be a little bit too out there and I'm going to lose them for an entire month, that's when you start thinking maybe I should do something simpler, more conservative, Same more familiar. So, yeah. so it's, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's nicer to be, to, to have more at bats. So if you strike out once, eh. You're I like be it. Up again in another half hour anyway. Well, yeah, and you can forget about the past, right? It's like be a goldfish, yeah. like Ted Lasso says, right? Just oh, there's the next one. You talk to professional athletes, and that's what they say is I, like if if you're a hitter in baseball, like you just got to you, you struck out, you just like you got to let it go because you're going to have another one in a, in a half an hour. You know what? I, I was surprised that when I, I I did audio, I was an A two for audio for the NFL for one of the games, and which means I run I ran memory cards. Like that's that was my job is to run memory cards around and and. uh it's just it was just an audio team that only manages when they say blue 25 blue 25 and so and our job is to make sure that the broadcast doesn't get the huddle right like somebody's there to make sure that the huddle doesn't go to the broadcast doesn't even go to the trucks and um i thought we were going to hear all this incredible stuff nope like there's there's just not enough time they get back there with 20 you think that they're all talking about the last play they are just calling the next play and getting <laughs> loaded focused. in there's no yeah. the only time you hear it is in timeouts <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're like, can you believe that? Call? Or when they're on you the like, sideline, you know, uh, sitting out yeah. and play, and then they go. But, but but when they're in the huddle, it's just like everyone gets back and they yeah. they say we're going to do a right for you know whatever, and that's and they just move no, on to the next things. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a thing. Eight hundred eighty-one Mac casts. Congratulations, Adam Christensen. He started his well first episode was December thirteenth, two thousand. Four actually, that was show zero, and a couple of days later, he did yeah, show but one. Still, that's the earliest days of podcasting. Uh, yeah. Our my first podcast was uh, the radio show in September of two thousand four, and I think there were a few, you know there was the Daily Source Code. There were a handful of podcasts, so this is very very early. Uh, and did Adam say why he's uh, hanging up his spurs? I I think I, I get the sense that they they. Um, because uh, he's at Backbeat Media, that they like moved it around and are putting him on their other show, oh, Mackie Gab, instead, right. and that there's a consolidation there. But also, I mean, you do it that long, maybe it is time to 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 change don't it up. Say that out bit, loud. Right? I don't want to. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's we're only we're young here, like 900. I mean, yeah. I don't even know what you're what you're talking about. Yeah, the first podcast I think I did was MacWorld, and it was 2005. Right, 2005 was the year where like. It, the first wave of trying podcasts, but the stuff, if you're pre 2005, you are original. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Adam yeah. Christensen's now yeah, uh, doing Mac geek gab with Dave Hamilton and uh, pilot Pete. They're at episode 1014. So yeah. They've been doing it forever. They're a little bit ahead of us, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's okay. It's okay. That's, uh, that's how it goes. But Adam is the greatest tidbit still lives. I'm sure. Right. That's the sure. longest, yeah, longest running tidbits. It is a website so long. This is a little bit like I, I tell people that I started a magazine on the internet before there was a web. Oh, I'm confusing we Adam Christensen with Adam Angst. Oh, Adam tidbits Angst. Is oh, yeah, Adam Angst. All the tidbits Adams are so, blurring. It's so old that <laughs> their first issues were distributed via hypercard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then email, and then the web eventually. Right, just like my my internet magazine was like, there was no website. It wasn't even a gopher. It was literally just Usenet or download a file via FTP because we didn't have a web back then. And the hypercard, that is. <laughs> wow. Live in large. Wow. Chef's kiss. Wow. Loved hypercard. Uh, yeah, and we've had Adam on, Adam Christensen. We've had Adam Angst on many times. We've had Adam, Adam Christensen on the show. I know we've many had Adam Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So many Adams. I apologize. Adam Angst for confusing you with Adam Christensen, but both long been running doing a long Mac time. Yeah. Uh, uh, for heroes, sure. you know, uh, I just, I've been stalling, got 7.2.1. Now, Alex, I remember your rule of thumb is don't get the major version. 
don't get the revision to the major version. Get the revision to the revision. So we are still waiting for 7.2.2. <laughs> is that right? I No, no. I, well, I'm on the... So the funny thing about me is that for my production machines, my Macs, I stay way behind. Yeah. Like I'm still waiting to update to to the you know the newest, <laughs> newest version. Uh, I mean, the, this year, like sometime this year, I'll do that. Or next year. Um, for my iOS devices, I'm super aggressive and probably not the way I should. I'm on the beta for the those things. I just throw them on. I'm like, ah, oh, if it doesn't work, I'll go to another phone or something. But but I, you know, there's things that happen. Like it sticks, you know, like it. That my so I never know what I'm on seven point three, seventeen point three right now. I think I think it just installed on my machines. But so I'm on the beta on this. I'm pretty aggressive about iOS because um, I want all the new things. Um, especially around, you know, the camera and stuff like that. And so, but with my computers, because I do work on them, I'm uh, much more conservative. So if you're, a, if you're, a, if reliability is job one, you don't update right away. I would suggest getting at least 17.2. I was reading Reddit uh, last week and somebody came on and said, I don't know how this happened. I was at a Christmas party and two thirds of the iPhones at the Christmas party died all at the same time. What could be going on? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, it is interesting Flip and it's back. been fixed in 17.2. <laughs> so this was a, a case of the uh, Flipper Zero, which I had and I, I gave it to rather Robert. But there was an, a, a, a third party firmware update to the Flipper Zero, which is really just a device with all kinds of radios that you can use for pen testing or hacking. And, uh, and somebody with a Flipper Zero, a pair, I'm going to guess... I don't know if we ever got to the bottom of that one, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there was somebody with a Flipper Zero who went into the party and using a Bluetooth LE exploit that Apple has since fixed, crashed everything. Yeah, it just goes to show that the, 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 the Flipper Zero was getting a lot of really super like angsty mainstream press attention, which is like, what is this? This Amazon is selling this device that allows hackers to mess with your phones and devices and 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 and, and parking garage fences and things like that. But it that this sort of thing kind of shows why the value of having these kind of pen devices like in random people's hands can be a good thing. That was a that was an that was a vulnerability that. Apple was unaware of or was not in a mood to patch and yet now here we have a patch that says who knows who knows how this could have been interfered with uh, in a less less of a, of a puckish way uh, as it was it was just people messing around and people oh wow hey look I was I was able to turn off people I was able to, to basically lock up people's iPhones for without them knowing that I was doing it but ah, again, ah. once you get once you have people twisting doorknobs I mean there, there's there's always that question of like I I I hate the fact that I have a set of lock picks from lock picking lawyers store, and once you test like all the locks you have in your house, you realize that ah, oh, damn it! Look how weak every Everything's single one weak. of these locks yeah. are. Yeah, and it's I don't like the I don't like the idea of some uh, knucklehead just buying something for ten bucks and then being able to let themselves into pretty much anything. On the other hand, I think this is a good opportunity for people to take their lock down to their locksmith and say, "Hi, this tool can open this lock very easily. I would like you to fix this lock so that cannot happen." And now I have locks that you can't do that with. So more more knowledge is usually a better solution than less love. Here's the, uh, the the Reddit post from four days ago. I was at a holiday party in the Loop of Chicago last night around 10 p.m. An estimated 20 to 30 other iPhones in mine shut down unexpectedly. It didn't happen at the same time, but within 10 to 15 minutes, all of our phones were down. I couldn't gain access to my phone for around 30 minutes. I could start it, but not open the phone. Later in the evening, the phone worked. This morning, my and others' phone said in, uh, an AirPod had been connected last night around 10 p.m. The cross street of the end, Hubbard and Dearborn. <laughs> well, uh, pretty pretty quickly on Reddit, somebody said, "Yeah, that's a uh, that's a known flipper uh, zero attack." And <laughs> this is the reason I bring it up. This is why you should be getting seventeen point two. And if you waited to seventeen point two point one, it's out today. I'm not sure what uh, what does it fix. Seventeen point two point one. Do we know? I don't know. About bug fixes and improvements, probably. Oh, there you go. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's, it's funny, always actually good. that. That flipper zero it reminds me of the TV Be Gone. Do you remember that? I yeah. still sell it. It's the it's you can a, use the flipper uh, it's zero a universal for that. remote yeah. to turn off TVs. So if you're in a restaurant or a or an airport or whatever, you can you can sort of zap it and some loud TV or in a actually it's where I eat breakfast at like a hotel or something, and they've got like some news show on at 
full <laughs> volume and you can just be like, oh, put it on your keychain and you just go boop <laughs> and it turns it off because it's a universal remote yeah. or just the power off button. Hilarious. Uh, there was some of the, yeah. Yeah. And, and journaling also comes in 17.2, the journal as well as the camera space. Seven, oh, yeah. In 17.2. I don't know right. about what's in point what's one. What's one? 2.1. 2.1. 17.2, yeah, has, yeah. The, has okay. the journal app. And the um, spatial the, video. And the spatial video capture, yeah, which we yeah, talked about. Don't Very do it. About. I mean, do it, but also take better videos than that. <laughs> it looks like it's just security fixes for 17.1.2. Yeah. 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 As always. Uh, somebody in the uh, Discord said, gee, the people at the party had to talk to each other. Wow. That must have been hard. <laughs> That's the you know, it's funny. I, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I do not use my phone when I'm with other people. Like, it's, it's a funny thing that I... You're alone, and I, and I, I have to say. No, I just, I just, you know, I, I uh, when I'm, I'm also like one of those people, like, people will ask me, like, why didn't you respond to my messages? I'm like, I was in a meeting. And they're like, well, that, why does that matter? I'm like, because I don't look down. Like, when I'm in a meeting, I look up and I just Good sit there you. and I'm in the meeting. Good for well, you. Well, it's just, it. It's just a, it's a better meeting, you know, when people are doing that. Of course. And Life is better if I, you pay attention. And more of my ideas go through when I'm present. So, so anyway, so, um, so I think that it's, but I, I, I have found that over time, and I wasn't always this way, but I really got into this habit of like, when I'm talking to people, I won't, my phone is always on do not disturb, like a hundred percent of the time, unless I turn it off for, mm -hmm. I'm expecting a call. It'll be off. Yeah. That's it's, actually you know, like, problematic for people calling me. I don't, my phone is always off. And always in do not yeah. disturb. I don't want calls. Yeah. 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 I don't want notifications. Like yeah. I have my, my notifications open from 9.59 to 10 o'clock at night. And it's like my, my Mac is like, oh, there's so many things I have to tell you. It like almost goes no, down the side, you know. And go away. <laughs> Go away. I'm like, no, I don't need to do that. Still needs to be a bummer to like be at, the car, be at a party and, oh, I don't have a camera anymore. Okay. Oh, yeah. well. Yeah. I do miss yeah. the camera. And when I did my digital detox, that was the one thing I did want to take pictures. I didn't miss anything else. And it was really slow to turn the phone back on because I knew that I was going to get flooded with stuff. Here is a wonderful picture Jason Snell just found from Andy 2006. Found it. Oh, I'm Andy, just passing found it on. It. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, who, I'm photobombing you guys. I, I rem actually remember that. That I, I was just scary. like, I'm just going to stick in there, stick myself in there in between them and be like, ee, there it is. That's great. Little did you know that was, that was the reason you're going to be Three quarters the of the show. panel yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Alex That's is one probably of taking the picture. Who is, yeah. who, is this, who is this sparky young upstart? I want to know. I will follow his career with yeah. considerable interest. <laughs> uh, so get your 17.1.2, even if you don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, 0.2.1. I guess I've been saying it wrong. Uh, you should certainly have 17.2 for, for that reason. Um, I wonder what, does Apple have a security uh, note or anything like that? No. This update provides important bug fixes and is recommended for all users. Well, there you go. Let's see. Yeah, do Let's it. See. Yeah. Uh, iPhone XS like or later. No published CVE entries. It doesn't mean there are no uh, flaws that it's fixing. It's just that they're not published. They're internal to Apple, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Just a thought. You might want to do it. Just go ahead and go, go to any holiday parties. And if you are, you might want to bring along your Flipper Zero uh, available. <laughs> it's about $129 available uh, at Finer Stories. I think it's $169. Oh, is it really? Is it? Yeah. yeah, it's on. You know, I, at 129, I was going to buy one. At 129, I was like, eh, oh yeah, right. They went up this. a little bit. Uh, I I bought one last year, or is it earlier? Maybe earlier this year. Did a little review of it. We we broke into the studio with it. Uh, I was going to start my car, and then uh, Russell, who's our IT guy, said, "You may not want to do that because uh, a lot of times with those rotate whatever those." Uh, you know, a revolving codes. If they detect an out of cycle code, yeah. they just stop working because they think somebody's trying to hack it. That's no fun. <laughs> Which is what's happening. That, well, this is, well, yes, but it's my own car. <laughs> can you hack your own car? Yes, you can. And they, uh, the fun thing about the Flipper Zero, and the reason they call it the Flipper Zero, besides the fact that it has a little dolphin pal uh, on it, is it has some games on it. So it's got plausible deniability. When uh, yeah. when they pull you over uh, at the customs and say what what is this? Uh, it's it's not for anything. I just like to play some games. Is All that these an unlicensed version of Tetris. You're coming with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a Bluetooth LE exploit, but it's not. It's funny. It wasn't built into the Flipper Zero. It's got open firmware, and somebody wrote some uh, firmware with additional yeah. features. Additional features. 
It's very cool. Yeah. In fact, Father Robert has mine, and he says he's put some additional features on it. <laughs> so I don't want to know. I don't. I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, Apple watches. You can't get one after Thursday. <laughs> what? Uh, if there's, you're looking for a Christmas well, gift, 20, right I now is the time. Technically, after, yeah. Well, yeah. It, in online uh, Thursday in Apple stores on uh, basically after Christmas, and as long as supplies last, you will be able to buy them. This is all in the U.S. Um, at other stores, but not Apple. Apple's not allowed to sell it, and this is all because of a ruling from a U.S. government patent body <sighs> that has basically said. Uh, and said six months ago, and unless the unless the Biden administration feels like there's a game of chicken ago. going six, on here, right? Days. So they had 60 days uh, in order to have this go into effect. The Biden administration can veto it if they want to. And also they're playing chicken here about like, are they going to pay them off? What are they going to do? But like, this is an order for Apple to stop, stop selling any iPhones with blood oxygen sensors. And that means the current Apple iPhone, watches. or sorry, Apple watches, Apple Watch Ultra Apple Watch 2 and, and Apple Series Watch Ultra. 9. Yeah. Are are so the SE will still be there, yay! But otherwise, yeah, this is um again, it feels like a game of chicken to me. But it's entirely possible that post Christmas Apple will not be selling the Apple Watch in the U.S. for a little while. Yeah, at least those newer those Wild. newer Apple watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those Apple watches also Apple can't import anymore into the country after the twenty exactly. fifth. So Apple is Apple is designed to be proactive while it uh, tries to again play that game of chicken uh but all but that means that anything that's already in the retail channel uh, that if, if if best buy already has like a month month long supply of these watches by the or 25th, six months <laughs> like, like you know like exactly. that's what, what I mean. however yeah. right, so the, the, the point is that like if, if someone if someone tries to sell you a watch for like eight times face value three days after christmas maybe hold off and also maybe apple will suddenly just get out of this checkbook and uh it's as 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 has been noted they had a whole bunch of options to make this go away one of which is to again hope that biden will uh, will veto it if he hasn't vetoed it by now maybe this was designed to basically give him one give the administration one hell of a nudge nudge to say hey we're serious about I bet there are a few letters to the economy going yeah. into yeah. santa uh, brandon you could sign yeah. that on christmas eve santa brandon and make everybody happy yes uh, or is it brandon Claus? Uh, i can never remember yeah and of course, and the other option yeah. is apple could just yeah. turn off the uh, blood oxygen monitor this comes from a lawsuit by massimo which is a company right. that makes a lot of these devices. They make a scale. They make a, but they say that the blood oxygen sensor they have the patent to that, and Apple never licensed it from them. Yeah, and so they sued. And this, and this, and they lost in court, yeah. but the I, the uh, ITC uh, nevertheless put the ban up, and uh, so up up to uh, either the ITC or the president, or to take it down, or Apple to take that capability out. They could do that. Or, or they could just say, okay, guess what? We're going to give you, they, I'm sure, I'm sure that Massimo has offered them a licensing agreement and Apple has said, we're going to wait until every other option has been I, removed. That's what it looks including, like. Including, right? yeah. yeah. And, and, and it also bears, uh, bears mentioning that Massimo is not a trap, not a patent troll. They are no. like a legitimate, like founder of this kind of technology. Yeah, and for sure. They had, to, they had the, 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 one of the sources of this lawsuit was that they said that they were having talks with Apple about license, properly licensing this technology or whatever, what kind of partnership they wanted to have. And that their claim is that Apple not only took uh, took their technology, but they also hired away a lot of their key executives, yeah. their, including like their basically top and, uh, med medical tech person. And, so and I think it, there's a lot powered behind this. And if, I, if I'm if I'm correct, it actually is worse than that. Is that Apple sued them first? So <laughs> so I think that the the issue. I mean, there's a whole bunch of there's a series of unfortunate I mean, a series of unforced errors on Apple's side yeah. that, that they got to this. This is this. Uh, we shouldn't feel too bad for Apple. They made a lot of mistakes here. <laughs> like, you know, so so they you know like so the the. I mean, I usually I'm on the Apple defense side, but this one was just not not a good idea. Like on their end, and 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 the. So the first thing is, is that it appears that they had the they had the meeting in 2013. Apple liked the technology, but really didn't feel like Massimo was a consumer form faced com company. It wasn't worth buying the whole thing and getting a hold of all the other things that they do. So buying the company didn't make sense for Apple. Um, but then they did exactly what Andy said hired a bunch of people like you know like we can in california we can do that all the time like we just hire each other you know hire other people <laughs> the problem is that what, what that brings is the potential of crossing over these patents but it doesn't appear that at least what i've read so far it appears that what opened this can of worms was that massimo created a watch 
and it, the watch, you know, and so they were promoting this watch and Apple sued them for infringement, which then they sued Apple for infringement. And then, and then the whole thing, you know, came apart. So, so anyway, so I think that, I think that that, that was the issue. Yeah. So there's the watch that they created and it looked a lot like the Apple watch. And so Apple sued them and opened up this can of worms, I believe in 2018 or 19, and and then now Apple's paying the price for it. So it's a lot of like not, you know, Apple doesn't lose these very often. Like with a live core, they lost. Apple ended up losing, but they had invalidated the patents by the time they lost. Like the, the patents were gone by the time they got there. And they just, they, they, I think that they thought they could do the same thing again and they didn't, you know, and, and so it is a, you know, but it's a solid company. Definitely not. This is a company that thought of this a long time ago. That's been working on it. That works on a lot of other products. This is definitely not one of those cases of, of someone just going after Apple and Apple, I believe, if I re if I remember what I read there, struck first. You know, like, like they're the ones that that if they had left things well alone, I think Massimo, it sounds like, was happy to just build the watch. But Apple, you know, picked a fight, and so um, so anyway, which Apple does. I mean, Apple defends what it considers its patents, and so um, so anyway, so I think that you know, and Apple just won't. Massimo, I think, has said a couple times that they're willing to do a deal. Like they're not. Oh, so they are, see that. I was that was one question I had: is are they willing to license yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, they've said that they're willing to license it. Okay. Apple. So this just is just Apple it. being curmudgeonly. Yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, they're, they're the problem with Apple is if you open up this door, how many other doors open connected to these yeah. similar things? Yeah. And so Apple, you know, they're going to make sure that everyone knows it's really painful, and you got to be really sure you want to do this with a big company. Um, and and so I think that that's part of their that's part of the the calculation here. The other thing is that they, they were at the downside of a of the of the rush for the watch. They're probably going to flush okay. the market, so they can't sell them. But of course, by announcing this a couple of days before Christmas, even I like I was thinking about getting one for my my daughter. Hopefully, she doesn't listen to the show. Now I'm like, oh, I got to get one really quickly here. You know, like so so the um, yeah, uh, but she's a kid. Apple you can get her an SE. You don't have to get her the full. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so so the um uh so but anyway, the point is, it had me thinking about it. Um, you know, and and so at the same in the same way, uh, the Apple will probably get a rush of orders they weren't going to get anyway. They'll flush the entire market, the Best Buy, Walmart market, or whatever, so that they have three months supply or six months supply or whatever, and they're probably not going to lose that much from it. So they they probably have a couple months, of, probably three to six months of buffer to continue to fiddle with this until they have to capitulate. You know, and I don't know if they will. Also, also paying them paying Massimo off means that basically taking a couple points off of the profitability of every single watch that they make for, right, into, the, right. into, 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 into the horizon. So yeah, I'm yeah, sure so, they're making the calculation like this is how exactly. hard they could have, they could have, they knew that this deadline was coming. I'm sure the Biden administration told them in the first week, whether they were going to, you yeah. know, do something about it or they have, you know, and so the thing is, is and, and, uh, um, but it is interesting that, that uh, Tim Cook wasn't able to cast his spell that he has <laughs> cast effectively yeah. Many, many times. Um, yeah, they they won they they won this uh, a while ago because one of the few things that Samsung won against Apple in their suit was a, a similar a similar ruling, and uh, the Obama administration stepped in and said, "Okay, we're going to veto this," largely because of I think Apple made the uh, an effect on the economy sort of argument that hey, if we stop making here's how much here's how much money money this the, this puts into the economy with app stores and everything else, and that was kind of an easy thing to go. But this is an accessory. This is not like it was i think you're right like either they're going to veto this very quickly or it was just never going to happen yeah. i think this is really consistent with apple's behavior and all sorts of different legal and regulatory challenges that they've had in the last few years right where, where we all we all talk about it and we say oh they should be preemptive and they should negotiate and all that and you know what they are very consistent they don't <laughs> they don't they wait to the last minute they take it as far as they can in court and we well, see and it here too, where they they like, the, and, and it may come back to hurt them, right? But it seems like they are very confident, and they're willing to sweat out anybody else. And I'm still not convinced that when we're back for our next live episode, that this isn't all resolved, right? Like it feels like a poker game is going on, a game of chicken, perhaps. But I don't know. It is also like this is super consistent with Apple. Like they. 
they will push it to the limit. They don't care how it makes them look. They don't. They just don't well, care because they think again, they can get the best result by doing that. But it's also it's not the best result for this one. It's the best result for all of them. For every small company or smaller company looking at doing a fight, know that we're going to take it all. You know, I'm sure that the, the the message to all of them is know that we're going to take this all the way to the, all the way to the end. Like we're not going to, you know, like we're not going to somewhere. I mean, sometimes they, they and Apple does settle on other things. They'll settle if they've decided there's nothing to be gained there, but. They have to be careful because, you know, every little company that has a meeting with Apple, you know, like, you know, is, you know, could could come back and say, well, you did something like, and this is why companies, by the way, if you send your script into Hollywood, they'll send it right back to you. If you don't, it's like an agent. Yeah. This is, a, yeah, like they don't want you to, like, and, and, and a lot of companies don't want you to tell them your ideas or give right. them any data because they're afraid you're going to sue them. Say, well, we had a meeting. I have and a, they may I have have standard a boilerplate already that I send out on. to people who suggest ideas for podcasts. Because I don't yeah. want to hear your idea for a podcast in case I'm already planning it. <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, Bloomberg says, Mark Gurman says, Apple's racing to tweak the software and uh, plan to submit a workaround to the customs agency, to the ITC, and maybe get the ITC to overturn their ban. Engineers, he's writing, engineers at the company are racing. And I, I tell you what, a week before Christmas, that's a big deal. Racing to make changes <laughs> to algorithms on the device that measure a user's blood oxygen level, a feature Massimo has argued infringes its patents. They're adjusting. So they're not going to take it out. They're adjusting how the technology determines oxygen saturation and presents the data to customers. They're hoping that the ITC will say, oh, yeah, that's no longer infringing. It's a high stakes engineering effort, unlike any Apple has undertaken before. Hmm. Yeah, well, because it's a it's a tightrope tightrope walk. They can't. They it's just as bad to uh, just introduce a, a patch that simply turns off those features until this has been resolved. Because how many people have bought these watches for that Apple's reason? Promise that I yeah, here's here's yeah. a feature that's and, included. That's that's an instant class action suit. But there are ways that it's it's not as though there's a thumbs up thumbs down to a patent infringement. It's like here is exactly what is uh, the the idea the idea of measuring blood oxygen saturation levels is not necessarily patentable in and of itself it's not it's even not just uh by uh shining light under the skin that's patentable it's the sp specific method that they've used so if they choose if apple said that you know what what if we change the wavelength to this what if we change the sample rate to this Massimo what says the hardware needs to change yeah they say a software fix will be an insufficient remedy and, and yeah. you know this is this is the same fight that apple's going to have with glucose because you know, they're, you know, there's a, a lot of, they're working on it. I mean, they're trying to figure out a non-invasive way of, no one's figured that, I mean, but they have all these companies that are measuring glucose right now. And so the question is, does anyone have those patents as well? And because glucose will be much bigger than oxygen levels is one thing. Glucose will change how people eat. Like it is, it will literally be a night and day change. It's, it'll do as much damage to the food business as Atkins did <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, so, uh, cause suddenly they'll see real time data. And so, so it's, I think Apple's definitely working down that path, but, but they're going to have the same, same problems because a lot of people are trying to crack the same code. And that usually means there's a lot of patents laying around uh, related to that. Yeah. Well, and a lot of patent trolls probably patenting periphery. Well, it's, it's, it's not just that it's you, you, so I, I've, you know, I've, worked in a couple companies that are consulted for a couple companies and what you're instructed to do a lot of times in these in these big companies is hey if you're standing in a field and you don't see anyone around you you should call our lawyers <laughs> like, you know, like if you if you're working on something and it's really like hey i can't find anything on the internet about what you're working on or you i can't do this you should call up you should call a, the you know you should at least have an interview with somebody about what you're doing and then we'll decide whether it's and you'll say i don't think it's patentable they're like yeah it is it's that's patentable it's so, so interesting so the, uh, to you know. see how people's attitude towards this or toward Beeper Mini. If you're an Apple fan, it's the other guys at fault. If you, I, the, and then there's I'll a whole bunch is, of people on Reddit who hate Apple, un, you know, at, <laughs> unreasonably, right. and who, you know, are going get them Beeper Mini or probably get them Massimo. <laughs> it's really well, interesting and, and how it breaks down. I, I'm. As you know, I'm usually defend Apple on these things. This was not necessary. Like they, I think they made a whole series of errors. But you make it. Like but you make not, a yeah. good point that they have to be really protective because they don't. This could get into a. It opens it, up a can of worms. It opens up oh, like, exactly. I, I understand the thought process, but there's a lot of places. There, there are three or four key places it's here that they look. could have done something different, yeah. and it didn't have to be this way. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that it's, this is well within the calculation that they're yeah. that they're making. 
All right, coming up, why everyone should have a clipboard manager, according to Jason Snell. Uh, mm. but, but yeah. For, yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> but first, a word from our sponsor, Discourse. And I happen to have a soft spot in my heart for Discourse because we have been using Discourse for years to run our forums, the twit.community forums. And I love Discourse. I actually have run forums many times in the past. I've used a variety of forum software. Discourse is definitely the king of the hill. And what's interesting is they don't even call it a forum software anymore because it does so much more. For over a decade, Discourse has made it their mission to make the internet a better place for online communities, including your community. Discourse is open source. That was important to me. Trusted by more than, get this, 20,000 online communities, including some of the largest companies in the world. And, I, you know, I don't know why, but for some reason... The other forum software I've used has always been a security nightmare. I've never had a problem with Discourse, and I let them host it. I have them host it, which means I'm always running the most up-to-date version. It's always secure. By harnessing the power of discussion, real-time chat, yeah, they've got chat in there now, and AI, Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate with your community anytime, anywhere. And you know, even one or two people can manage a pretty large community. It's it's me and Paul Holder. The two of us manage the entire Twitter community by ourselves. It's easy. If you're ready to create a community, visit discourse.org slash twit. We're going to get you one month free on all self-serve plans. Um, I think this is just the best, whether you're starting out or want to take your community to the next level. There's a plan for you. If you've got a a, a club a family you maybe want a family discourse there's a basic plan for a private invite only community i love that there's also a standard plan if you want unlimited members and a public presence and for the higher end businesses if you want an active customer support community for instance there's a great business plan one of the biggest advantages to creating your own community with discourse is it's private you own your own data you'll always have access to your history of conversations and Discourse will never sell your data to advertisers. Ad-free, it just works. It's great. And users love it. Discourse gives you everything you need in one place. Make Discourse the online home for your community. And so many companies now are using Discourse for customer support. It's a really great idea for customer support. Visit Discourse.org slash twit. One month free on all self-serve plans. That's a great deal. Please go to that address so they know you saw it here. Discourse.org slash twit and we thank them so much for their support what is a clipboard manager and why do i need a mr six colors.com yeah i i mean this is a piece uh that was spun off of a piece i wrote uh, the other week about how apple's really gotten good with the defaults on mac os like back in the 2000s when os 10 was new a lot of stuff was not there and so i started adding utilities and other apps in order to solve the problem and um, I realized that actually the defaults are pretty great and people should probably start with the defaults. But the one thing that I kept thinking about was a clipboard manager. And I, I, I discovered in writing about this that lots of people don't even know what it is or don't think about it, don't think they need one. And, uh, and that struck me as like, it's so useful. I need to spread the word about this. So a lot of people out there will know it and they'll just nod along. But like a concept, the clipboard's weird, right? Like the clipboard from the very beginning in the original Mac OS is like this invisible space. You can't see the clipboard. It's just kind of like out there. You can, you, there's like a clipboard window in the finder you can show, which is also weird. And, but it's one thing, right? Like you can have one item. It could be a giant image. It could be like one letter of text, but it lives on the clipboard. And the next time you copy something to the clipboard, it's gone. Clipboard's super important when you're moving data around on the Mac from the very beginning. It still is. We all get cut, copy, paste. They all make sense. But it, it's it's like, you know, in, the, in like 1990, when I used Photoshop, there was this thing where like, once the little dots went away, you couldn't edit anymore. We didn't have multiple undo. We had a single level of undo. This is like 1980s technology that we still have today which is if you copy something on top of something important on your clipboard, it's gone and you can't get it back. You can't undo it. It's just gone. Also, it leads to lots of inefficiencies where you've got like two windows and you've got like stuff over here and you need to paste it into specific places over here. And you go, 
click, select, copy, click, <laughs> select, copy, and you go back and forth on that. All of these things go away. First off, you save yourself from the disaster of copying over an important thing on the clipboard and then having to go get it, if, assuming that you haven't lost it forever, by having a history of items. Think of it like a browser history, a history of items in, the, in your clipboard. Because then you're like, oh, where was that thing? And this happens to me all the time. Where was that thing that I needed like eight clipboards ago? And instead of going and finding it, you just go to the list of your clipboard history and you say, there it is, and you grab it and you use it. But once you start knowing that it's there, you can also start copying with impunity because you know you've got a big stack and it changes your behavior. And one of the great ways is if you have to go from A to B, you can go to A and go copy, 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 and then go to B and go paste, 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 paste. It's way more efficient. So just for your safety of not having things blasted off the clipboard, I think clipboard managers are good. I also don't think that they're super nerdy. I know it sounds super nerdy, but the truth is if Apple built this into Mac OS, they could just put it in the edit menu. You know, like we already got copy paste. A little history that's like a browser history would not be that hard to do. Uh, most of the utilities that enable this let you have a little shortcut, a little keyboard shortcut that brings up a floating window or a little drawer on the bottom that lets you select an item from the past and bring it forth. It's just, you know, and, and like the most popular one of these, I think, is PasteBot from TapBots, and it's like 13 bucks. And like for my money, if there's a single utility that does a fundamental thing that is great for the Mac that Apple doesn't provide, it's probably PasteBot <laughs> because for $13, if you copy something and then copy something over it you can do a keyboard shortcut or go to the menu bar and find your previous thing and paste it in just super useful so it just i wanted to spread the the word because <laughs> it turns out some people do not know this and and it really is weird when you think about the fact that apple has left this untouched essentially other than the continuity clipboard thing which lets you paste like two different devices it's basically conceptually untouched since 1984 or really since 1980 when it was invented for Lisa, <laughs> it has been untouched. And I, I just, I, I'm always loath to suggest that Apple change stuff that is so fundamental to the operating system. But in this case, I don't think it would add complexity because the clipboard is already invisible. And if you never know about the history, you never need to use it. But the idea that you could in the edit menu nestle in there a little bit of a clipboard history, I think it would be a, a huge win. But the good news is if you're a Mac user, and, and they, sh they should do it on iOS, by the way. But if you're a Mac user and you're not using a clipboard manager now, you should. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, yeah, there's there's PasteBot, which is great. Um, there are a bunch of other utilities out there, too. If you've got Setup, there's an app called Paste that you get as part of Setup. I will also say if you've got a launcher like Alfred or LaunchBar or Raycast, they already have clipboard managers in them. If you have Keyboard Maestro, it already has like all the it's a feature in all sorts of other utilities, too. But like I couldn't live without it. It completely changed how I use my Mac and that there are people out there who don't know that this is an idea. It's like. I got to spread the word. So I'm going to be little Johnny clipboard seed. Good for you. I have <laughs> a, uh, I have a, I, my Emacs has a kill ring, which I use all the time. So I, I support that. Now there Same is a concept. security, there is a security issue you should be aware of because most people use their password manager to put passwords right. on the clipboard. So clipboard utilities, almost all of them, if not all of them have a limit applications field that will not store information from particular apps. And I checked in LaunchBar, which I use, and uh, the password password stuff is off by default, I think, because I've checked and I don't think I've ever set that setting and it's already off by default. So if you don't want to store your passwords and things or any other kind of app that you were like, no, not that one, you can actually set it to go. But otherwise, I mean, so, so there are security and privacy issues that um, generally all these apps that do this know that and they they empower you Good. to make that choice yeah bitwarden uh also has a setting to take it off the clipboard but i bet it doesn't i bet it's not pastebot aware so you want to make right, sure if it's stashing it away that. yeah right yeah. exactly yeah. but you can do that good well, I, I hope good. that wasn't your pick it's not my pick <laughs> okay I, oh man it could have been i don't actually know could what my have pick's been gonna be i now. stole <laughs> your pick i'm so sorry
But uh, yeah, we'll we'll. But we'll, I saw we'll that and I thought, I, you, you know, know, brilliant. Tell a friend. Yeah. Also, all all the all the nerds out there who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, Jason, I know already about it. Whatever. It's like okay, holidays, hanging out with somebody. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Tell a friend. Spread the Be word. Johnny spread Clipboard the word. Clipboard manager. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Change your life. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I uh, am in the market for a new car. I can tell you without a doubt that there's two models I will not buy. One is uh, Tesla because it doesn't support CarPlay. And the other now is GM because they're oh, not going to support CarPlay either. So we talked about this this summer, but this is like they doubled, they doubled yeah. down and then backed off. It's a hilarious thing where... The, the guy at GM who's in charge of the infotainment stuff basically came out and said, well, oh, we're doing this to protect you because what we found is that AirPlay and Android Auto or, uh, yeah, are, are, they're, they're unreliable <laughs> and it makes, it makes the user pick up their phone because it doesn't work reliably as CarPlay or Android Auto. And then, then they're holding their phone. It's, it's just very unsafe. And we think when they're just using the touchscreen in the car with our app, It'll be they'll it'll be, be fine. They'll be which is much the most less cockamamie to pick up their excuse <laughs> to not do whatever because they're trying to do it so that they can charge upsell you on some subscription service or whatever. And the hilarious well, thing they want about the it data. Story, it's worse than that. This, they want yeah. to spy on you and, and they want all your, all your metrics. And so the, this appears in Car and Driver. And hilariously, the next day, motor a PR trend. person or Motor Trend. Thank you, Andy. Uh, a PR person contacts the reporter and says <laughs> that they were misrepresented, which is hilarious because it's your executive, folks. It's your record. But they're like, no, 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 no. We, we, we have good relationships with Apple and Google. Uh, and, and, and we take, we take it back because they're yeah. basically throwing CarPlay and Android Auto on yeah. the bus there. Yeah. Uh, just, or, or the car or whatever that you throw yeah. something under. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's just so asinine. It's also and nonsense. The immediate response is Ford's guy immediately comes out and says, once again, we love them. We <laughs> yeah. love uh, uh, CarPlay and Android Auto. We I love never the, give them up. It works so nicely in my uh, Mach-E. Oh. I love it. And I would not consider a vehicle that didn't offer it, frankly. So dumb. Uh, yet yeah. motor. So it's Tim Babbitt, who's GM's head of product for infotainment, uh, who, said, who said you're more likely to pick up your phone with those, which is, you know what, if you've ever used an auto company's infotainment system, you know it's exactly the opposite. Those are terrible systems. Terrible. Uh, GM but then the told screen, Motor no, Trend, the and this is from 9 to 5 Mac, we wanted to reach out to clarify comments about GM's position on phone projection were misrepresented. And to re... Oh, that's interesting. Maybe they, they're saying we they got he got misquoted. And to reinforce our valued partnerships with Apple and Google and each company's commitment to driver safety, GM's embedded infotainment strategy is driven by the benefits of having a system yeah. which allows for greater integration with a larger GM ecosystem <laughs> and vehicles. I really yeah, like yeah. our Chevy it, Bolt. It, it, I would not consider buying one without CarPlay. Never. Yeah. At least, at least Motor Trend challenge, challenge them on this. We got like, if you look at the piece itself, um, quote: Babbitt's thesis is that if drivers were to do everything with their vehicles built the system, they'd be less less likely to pick up their phones, and therefore the less traffic. However, he admits, though, GM hasn't tested this thesis in the lab or real he world made yet, it up. but believes it has potential if customers go for it. Made it up. I, I think it ah, the follow up question. <laughs> The, the, two, <laughs> the two challenges is the number one is there, you know, all these manufacturers are trying to figure out how do we get you into more monthly payments to us? That's you true. Know, not to, not to your lease, but to an actual, like, this is a service that we can add and we can charge you $20 a year and we're making money. BMW on BMW was going to charge for CarPlay. They, they dropped yeah. that after. After people after, like, screamed. What? Yeah, and <laughs> and the and so I think that they're looking for more ways to add those services. I think the other problem that they have is that Apple, like CarPlay, is getting. I think they. I think a lot of them saw how advanced it was getting, and if and if people get used to the more advanced features of CarPlay, the chances of them ever getting back, like they're kind of like there's some point where they just have to give up, which they should have done a while ago because their interfaces they're not very good, but the the distance between their built-in interface and CarPlay is just slowly stretching. And and Android Android's doing a good job as well. The point is, is that they don't know how to, car companies don't know how to do interfaces. Like, like, like that people are interacting with. They're good at the, what you're using. They spend billions on what you see when you're driving, but the actual how a human interacts with a, a screen is not their area of strength. Yeah. 
and, and and also the data is so valuable from those from yeah, all the of those systems. Reason. And so the, yeah. yeah, and so if car so if basically CarPlay and Android Auto are saying that no, Apple wants the data and they'll protect you, they'll protect GM from getting access to it. And that's like no, we want to know like when you were accelerating, what song were you listening to, and how can I help sell you a special kind of candied yam based on your acceleration. I figure behavior. Android's doing the same thing, right? Oh no, of course. But uh, is Apple? Uh, or not they say not right they've actually addressed this yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's yeah it's it's more it's more like again it, uh, uh, apple's more liable to be very very private about user data and so that's not so apple uh, gm and ford and everybody they would love to have as much access to data as possible they're already collecting information on driver habits location everything you can possibly get your seat position everything is being transmitted back and the idea of being locked out of also consumer behavior like what media are you listening to at what time uh, is too valuable for uh, for a forward-thinking profit-making company like gm to want to simply say maybe there is a way that we could get access to the entire fire hose not just 91 percent of it you uh, probably all know about uh, the story we didn't cover it at the time but that in fact uh, cars uh, systems are even checking out when you're having uh, sex. <laughs> These are the car brands that are, this is from Mozilla, Mozilla report that are collecting data on your sex life. Um, of course, the Tesla is the worst, uh, according to uh, Mozilla, but Hyundai, 84% of the car brands actually share according to Mozilla, the personal data with third parties, including data brokers. Well, everybody's sharing them. There's so much money in data brokering. <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, yeah. and there, and it's, and it's how, you know, uh, I still find it amazing. Uh, I, you know, I had taken Instagram off my, my phone for years and um, I put it back on because they just, you know, they just started supporting um, RTMP in, in just, so I'm going to start testing live streaming to Instagram. Ooh, so I cool. haven't had, and, um, you know, because they, they had their, I don't know, their, their head in a dark place for a couple, you know, decade. <laughs> and, um, and the, uh, the, so they, they just started doing that last week. So I was like, oh, I'm going to, I need to test this. So I put my Instagram back on my phone and immediately got ads based on things that I had done over the last two days. <laughs> it's, like, it's definitely not Instagram. Yeah. Search, they're not, it's not that Instagram was watching me. It's that Facebook is buying all this extra data and immediately knew exactly what to, what to serve me up as ads. And I was kind of, I found that, that to be amazing. According yeah, to uh, Mozilla the research, popular global brands, including BMW, Ford, Toyota, Tesla, Kia, and Subaru can collect deeply personal data such as sexual activity, immigration status, race, facial expressions, weight, health, and genetic information, and, of course, where you drive. Data gathered by sensors, microphones, cameras, and phones, devices that are connected to their cars, as well as by car apps, company websites, dealerships, and vehicle telematics. And then they sell it on. Yeah. There's a, there's a, well, there's one car company that a company that owns car companies uh, that has actually said that we were trying to, we're trying to get as much as twenty billion dollars a year from customer wow. data. That's like one of our that's Nis the shareholders. Nissan's so, privacy yeah. policy actually says they 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 collect sexual activity. It doesn't say how. I'm not, I I'm I'm I don't know accelerometers. Uh, <laughs> In the seats? Uh, no, just in the car. The car, the, you know, the, no, but, but, but accelerometers in the car will tell you, you. You'd be surprised. Like I can, I was talking to someone who does sensors and they were talking about the fact that if you're walking around, we don't, we can actually guess your heartbeat yeah. you know, just by your walking, you know, yeah. how you're walking. But also we can tell who you are. So from your accelerometer, we can, we can look at your face and confirm it, but just by how you hold your phone and how you walk around, oh, Lord. we know that you have the phone, you have the same, you're the owner of that phone or not, you know, like, you know, and, and all the, the aggregation of all that data, but the accelerometers are incredibly powerful um, when, when they're, when they're uh, looked at over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. I guess sometimes you look at a car and you, you just can kind of tell something's going on inside there. Yeah. Just something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> something, something's happening. Um, I'm going to stick with my 2014 Dodge Caravan. I think, it, I don't think there's a lot of sensors Does in this there. caravan be rocking? Uh, Apple Podcasts are launching uh, or have launched in Tesla vehicles. 
that's good for yeah. us. Yeah. Isn't that funny? That, that So, the you know, CarPlay, no, but Apple Music and now Apple Podcasts in the last few months have come to Tesla. They have a new web-based platform that they're moving a lot of their media apps to, their Spotify implementation, which I think used to be more an app and is now also in that same kind of using a web-based player that they have built in and then so you, it, then they just modify it for the various different media companies it seems to be a an easier way for them to build it because they have their own platform and although there's some rumors that they want to do an app store i mean who knows but like who would do uh anyway th so <laughs> if you're an apple ecosystem person you don't get carplay in your tesla but you will get now Apple Podcasts and Apple Music. Apple Music was a few months ago. And so I assume, I mean, the advantage here is this ecosystem play. Like if you listen to your podcast on Apple Podcasts, uh, it is frustrating to get into a Tesla because you have to control it on your phone. And as GM has told us, that's very dangerous. That's a bad so, idea. Uh, yeah. Now, now you, it will it will sync and play that stuff directly in the Tesla using another, uh, another app. So, I mean good i guess right and and with spotify support that means the two biggest pl uh, podcast platforms are now on tesla but it does just make you ask the question why not just do carplay and call it a day well, and they it, just are I, they, they're too proud of their own homegrown thing which like i get it but but as with gm it's sort of like and i don't use apple podcasts i use overcast so like no car maker is going to support overcast you know what supports overcast is is iOS, CarPlay. which is running on my phone in my yes. pocket. And so CarPlay yes. supports yes. it and every and Libby that. and Audible and every other thing that is not supported by these bespoke car operating systems. But still, yeah. if you're an Apple podcast user, it's great news because your podcasts are now just going to be on your screen in your Tesla. It is a hey. win in that sense. Yeah. They 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 want they don't want you to become to be an Apple CarPlay customer. They want you to always feel as though you're being a Tesla customer all the way. Um, and this is kind of interesting with a piece of news that got that came across today that apparently the Disney Plus app uh, is being deleted from Tesla's entertainment centers uh, systems. Apparently, uh, apparently, if you haven't used it in a while, it's being automatically deleted. A lot of people, like in the Hollywood press, are wondering: Is this part of like Elon Musk's vendetta against Disney for oh, pulling what? advertising? Uh, yes, but it turns out know, it's, it, it's actually not even uh, true. Uh, they, they're hiding it, but not deleting no. it. And if you go into the browser and type in DisneyPlus.com, oh, no. uh, it, it just goes full screen and the app gets re-added to Tesla Theater, according to Not a Tesla yeah. app, which is a site that covers the Tesla software. So this is literally, it is performative anti-Disneyness by Tesla and Elon. Um, but the truth is that if you if you've used Disney Plus, it doesn't disappear. And if you go to the browser and type DisneyPlus.com, it just brings it back because it's <laughs> still there. It's just actually an still there. Another I don't so want to buy a car company car from a company run by a peevish man boy. That's not right. That's a no way to run a car company. Come yeah. on. Well, no, the, good, the good news is he's so he's leveraged so much of his Tesla, Tesla ownership for all of his other loans that you do have to wonder in the long run uh, if he's going to be able to keep control of that company. But who well, knows? He may run into the ground. And the hard part is, is that is that you know Tesla was way out in front, but I don't know. Like now, when we think about electric cars, I mean, as we go through the next decade, you know. By 2035, almost all the cars will be electric at that point. And, yeah. um, and so there won't be, you know, it, the question is, is really can Tesla stay different for that long? And yeah, I'm, right. I'm not, not certain. Like They're when winning right out, now by being the least expensive. Kind of I mean, I, you know, I, Alex is in Marin. I'm up here in uh, Sonoma County. There's nothing but Teslas, it feels like. Everybody's driving Well, you know, Tesla. the Model Y is the best-selling car in America. Yeah, um, yeah. And certainly, it has been in California for a while now. It, it is, though, like, the, so BYD... The Chinese automaker has is expected is caught up and is expected to become the biggest seller of electric vehicles in the world. But in so, China, you know, there it is. It is China, well, and Europe and other parts of the world, uh. but not in America. But like this is right. Like I, I, I agree with Alex. The, the challenge with Tesla is it is great that they have been out in the forefront and they make good cars. But the problem is. Part of their differentiation has been that they have been out on the forefront and when they're not out on the forefront anymore. And I wonder, Elon is distracted. And when we see him using his powers inside Tesla, it's for stuff like the Cybertruck, which I think is going to be kind of a flop, even though technically it's very impressive. It, it, it looks dumb and I don't think people want to buy it. 
uh, how what happens? How do you redefine who you are as Tesla when every other car maker is trying to take your yeah, lunch? That's true. Yeah. That's when panel gaps start to matter. That's when your your relationships with labor start to matter. Yeah. Yeah. This is when the fact that the major car makers have been making cars at a much larger scale than Tesla for generations, that starts to matter. Yeah. I do yeah, think, though, I, I, I do think that we, when we look back, I mean, Elon Musk will have all those the things that worked and didn't work about Elon Musk. But I think that they, when it comes to who, in, who impacted the environment more than anybody else as far in a positive way, it may come back to like him goading, you know, depending on how we, man, how we think about batteries. But from a, from a using fossil fuels perspective, when you look at the roof, the batteries, the Teslas, my, my neighbor has a, a Tesla roof, a Tesla batteries, yeah, we Tesla do too. cars. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, they're not, they're kind of off the grid in that sense. I mean, they're not, you know, and, and, um, you know, it's, it is, it's not just Tesla. It's that, I don't know if it, we probably still have all gas cars if Tesla hadn't come out. Yeah. I mean, like, like, Credit, you know, the, we're we have the, too. The, I mean, maybe not by now, but they certainly maybe, jump started I mean, the industry. Well, no not that succeeds like success. The fact that the Model Y has done so well, like if if they hadn't already gotten the message, there is that nothing says it more than yeah. oh geez, who has, is selling lots of cars? Right. Yeah. Why isn't that us? Right. It's a big deal. Yeah. Well, for and sure. and and the fact that I mean they there was the insight and everything else. I mean there there have been other cars that have been all electric for a long time and they got buried. Like literally the, the the car companies just buried those cars. Um, so it wasn't like Tesla was first. They were just the ones that proved proved that they could do it. And so I think, you know, for, you know, I think that's going to be an interesting part of that that process. But of course, I think he is burning everything up in the atmosphere yeah. right now. Yeah, it's, it's too like, bad. It's just like. <laughs> uh, beeper. <laughs> we can give you our weekly beeper <laughs> update. Be, the beep. Beep, beep. It's, uh, it's the weekly beep. The weekly beep. Um, we, we need, we need, we need a, a stinger beep, 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 beep. and have this thing go like, okay, oh, yeah, coming in the weekly. Beep. I have it on my uh, pixel eight, uh, uh, and it works a little bit <laughs> working right. a little bit is not what you're looking for in a messaging app. Uh, half the messages aren't coming in, half aren't going out, but some are going out, some are coming in. That's not really a good look. Uh, they, I, apparently they think they're going to be able to get it fixed. I think this just prompts Apple to move a little bit quicker, get an RCS working. Uh, and then Beeper will go away, fade away into the background. Yeah, I agree. It's it's so it, the, the thing is, the, the, the feature of a messaging app is, is always consistency. And as soon as it starts dropping any messages for any reason, that's when you start, especially if it's a brand new app you've just started using, that's when you basically put that in the back of the app drawer and never use it again. They're making so, it free, but big deal, right? Even, you know, even free. It's not it's not worth the price. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, all right, let's take a little break now that we've done our beeper segment of the week. <laughs> Uh, we to keep our liquor license. Yes, we have <laughs> to do just, that. It's a regulatory thing. It's a yes. regulatory thing, although I have a feeling there won't be another beeper update uh, for a while, if ever. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Our show today brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV, those great folks at ACI Learning. Yes, ACI Learning is now IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is now ACI Learning. They, they got together, and in fact, that's made them a powerhouse in training of all kinds for audit, for cybersecurity, for IT. I know you know the name IT Pro TV from our network. And all year long, ACI Learning has been our studio sponsor. So I, I'm thinking you probably know the name ACI Learning now. And you probably know that uh, IT Pro TV has brought in their, their incredible studios and skill set to ACI Learning. ACI can use that to keep all the courses current. They got courses in everything from Microsoft Cloud and AWS to CompTIA and on and on and on. And if you, so it's great for an individual getting into IT, get those early certs so you can get that first job. But I also want to talk about IT teams. If you have an IT team, it's so important you keep them happy and keep them trained. Important to your company, important to them, and IT teams significantly benefit from IT Pro. ACI Learning has kept all the fun, the personality, the passion of IT Pro TV, but amplified their robust solutions for all your training needs. Now, your team can be entertained and informed at the same time with short form content, 20 to 30 minutes, full transcripts, and over 7,200 hours to choose from. 
You asked. ACI is delivered just in time to wrap up your annual CPE. ACI is re-releasing their entire audit catalog in shorter, easier to digest versions which also means your CPE exams for each course will be faster as well. Check out their new audit courses and lab releases this month, including Certified Information Systems Auditor and CompTIA Security Plus. Get the full scoop on how ACI can help you navigate the audit world by visiting acilearning.com slash blog it pro tv now aci learning keeps your business from risking redundancy via the most up-to-date certifications and courses available constantly being updated you'll get the the personal account manager will make sure you're not wasting anyone's time your account manager will work with you to ensure your team only focuses on the skills that matter to your organization leave redundant unnecessary training behind that makes nobody happy and by the way, I should mention ACI Learning is ISO certified. You're getting the world-class training your team deserves. Keep your IT team up with the speed of technology. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners, you can get a free trial and up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution plan. 65% off. Now, the discount will vary depending on the size of your team. So fill out the form. Get that discount. Find out how much you'll save at go.acilearning.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support. We appreciate ACI Learning for being our studio sponsor all year in 2023. That's great. Uh, let's see. What else, what else is going on? Apple has decided to up the ante when it, when it comes to metadata, in particular push notification Data. This started uh, when Ron Wyden, the uh, senator from Oregon, wrote uh, an, a letter uh, uh, to Apple and uh, Google. Actually, I guess he wrote a letter. Who did he write the letter to? Anyway, he revealed that uh, federal officials were requesting data from Apple and Google about notifications, push notifications. And that data can be very useful. The metadata can be very useful. Wyden said the practice gave Apple and Google unique insight into traffic flowing from apps on their phones to users, putting them, quote, in a unique position to facilitate government surveillance of how users are using particular apps. So Apple has decided to update its guidelines so that you will have to go to a judge to get that data. They never issued an official statement uh, Google said in a statement it had always required judicial approval to hand over that kind of information. Wyden said in a statement, Apple's doing the right thing by matching Google and requiring a court order to hand over push notification related data. Why, why is push data so valuable, so important? Oh, man. It, it is the heartbeat of your phone's connection and the apps on your phone's connection to the world. At least it can be. <laughs> And if you've ever been on a, an airplane that does free texting uh, using iMessage, um, if you turn that on, you'll discover you get all your push notifications. It's not just iMessage. They're all using Apple's push notification service. So all the messages, including ones that you never see. So like Flighty, the flight tracking app, has a mode where it updates your status. If you're, if you're logged into like iMessage on your airplane's Wi-Fi, and not paying for full internet, just iMessage, yeah. Flighty keeps updating its status. And the way it does that is there are silent, invisible push notifications uh. coming from Apple's servers being accepted by Flighty, and it's using it to update its data. So there's a lot of data going back and forth. It's not encrypted, I don't think, right? So the, And there's meta. it's metadata about your phone. So if there's a push notification with the contents of a message, there's the contents of the message. You can see that you're getting them at certain times. And, and, and so... It is, it's interesting because this is what happens when some levels of security are locked down is that they move to other places that are less secure and push notifications. I imagine what we're going to see is that uh, push notification data is going to get more obscured and oblique uh, as a result of this. But if you're sending pushes, you're still, that data is still there. Apple knows that you got push notifications or you sent push notifications at a particular time. So there's a level of disclosure that um, 
that it's like a log. It's like a little bit of a log and a trace of your behavior. And and if they don't get your actual data, it gives them a clue, like cell phone records, basically, of what your behavior might be. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. And you may not, it's not just the pushes you see. You're not see aware of it. Because, it's not just your dates. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, like podcast apps do this where they are sending updates saying, hey, this, this um, episode got updated. Right. And you may not get a push notification that says, hey, it got updated. It may just know to go download it in the background so that it's there when you launch it later. That th there's a whole infrastructure behind the scenes that is used, uh, that is using the push notification method as the way they do it. It's a back channel communication system. Yeah, and there's so much data going over it. It really is a privacy problem. I mean, you can use flight just the flight information alone. If I'm in a plane, they know exactly where I am, and when yeah. I'm landing and all that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm a little surprised Apple hasn't been asking for a subpoena uh, and, to and, give that. And Jason, does it, if you turn off, it, do you know if it, if you turn off notifications, does it still get to you? I think most notifications are in it's notification hidden. center, right? So I think what you would have to do is turn off background app refresh right. or, uh, or put it in low power mode or something like that. that then I think that an app, but if right. you register... You know, if you register for notifications, then you're, there's a remote server that's trying to send Even you your notifications, Even your email right? is pushing. Those are going to go through. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, for long, there's two ways to get data. There's pull and push. Pull is you go out on the internet and you download a site because you typed it in. Uh, and it's of some use, but really, push is really valuable. Like your email can say, hey, we got new mail. Your podcast uh, can say, hey, we got new podcasts. And so a lot of apps use push. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Right. And it, and then it saves power and it saves data and all those things. Yeah. And things are happening on the server and then it sends you a little bit of a ping. Right. Um, and for me, I mean, the reason I use the airplane example is that's that example where you can see. So when you're on Southwest Airlines, you sign up for free texting, you don't get the full Internet. And that's some surprising yeah, things yeah. come through because yeah. all they are doing is gating that one Apple push notification service because that's how all iMessages come in. Right. And a surprising amount of other information can come in. And that is the stuff that they're looking at. I wonder if Apple didn't have this term because they had been, it's the it's the thing that Ron Wyden kind of like unlocked for them, which is they had been told they needed to provide this information and couldn't talk about it. And once that was the case, they may have been felt, That's exactly felt at right. least legally that they were trapped. They couldn't right? say anything. Until they got unlocked by then, Ron Wyden. Then Wyden, by making it public, uh, eliminated their need to stay quiet. And that's, yeah. Wow. Right. By the way, so I just realized like their canary. that the mithril in your dwarvish on your sweater is starting to shine. Is there an orc nearby? I I mean, it's it's... I'm I'm full. This is my Lord of the Rings ugly sweater because I'm I'm. It is the season, right? Yeah. So what is it? Does it have uh, the uh, Fellowship of the Ring on there? What is, what is that group on your? Uh, oh yeah, there they go. There's Boromir with his horse, and uh, oh wow, interesting. Oh yeah, I'm I'm full, and that's celebrating. Uh, not only is it the green lovely, but of course, if you're if you're like me, you celebrate Hobbit Hanukkah, which is uh, six nights of watching the extended editions. <laughs> God, half. Half each when nightmare. for all six nights, and it's That's a miracle because at the end they it's it's I love that movie. I love those the movies. Oil so. never runs not out. Not the Hobbit. Not the Hobbit. Lord of the Rings extended editions. Okay, yeah. you watch Agreed. half of it every night. For six nights, this is a family tradition. Uh, it's great. Aww, I can't wait to do cute. it again. Now that I've been, now that I've been to New Zealand and seen the the like sets and stuff, I would love to do that again. So we'll. How do much that more is in the extended edition? Is it much oh, it's longer? a lot more. Oh. It's a lot more. They're very, very long, but it's yeah. good. It's great stuff. Great. That's the They're way to really do good. it. Yeah. That's, and you have that's the like a mini series. It's just the, like a six part mini series. And the extras are amazing in the box in the for the extended versions. If you yeah. bought the extras, they have like tons of tons of movies about bigotures and and uh, the, the 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 Balrog and the you know like a lot of things. It's really good. Yep. Oh my God! So the Fellowship of the Ring Ring. Theory Theatrical runtime was two hours, 58 minutes. Long enough. The extended runtime is three and a half hours. And worth it. That's the minute. stuff. Uh, that's the good stuff. The Two yeah, Towers is 44 minutes longer. The yeah. Return of the King is it, almost an hour longer. It. 
If you're going to yeah. watch these movies, can I, watch these movies. Can I get it on right? iTunes? Can I it's it's like a body. Reader's Digest condensed version of Lord of the Rings. No, get the whole Get the DVD thing. set, the get the UHD. I think the Return of the King, and like half of it is saying goodbye. Like there's like, It is. Yeah, it's, it's like a long like goodbye. Of, of, of the, the end is now like an hour long. So yeah. So you're saying I should crying, I mean. should buy the, yeah. the, the... I don't have a DVD player. Well, you can get the uh, yeah, you can get blue, those on I, I, uh, you know whatever. It's not even iTunes anymore, right? It's like in the TV app or on Amazon or whatever. You can get the digital versions and the extended. Is that version. okay? I, I, well, yeah, I think I think the extended. I give version, you permission. Yeah, I think it has a lot of the extra. I mean, the one thing I will say is the extras on at least. I mean, that's why I buy you have to buy movies. a UHD player. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're really cheap now. The Blu-rays are they? The Blu-ray. Yeah, they're like ninety dollars or something. Yeah, like I picked not. up the UHD discs because I wanted to get that full four K action. Why not? Why not? I love yes. those movies. Those are, they're great. Anyway, so this was I needed an ugly sweater, and I went Lord of the Rings. That's, uh, uh, I think that's know, the best so. ugly sweater. Great. Do you have a preference for which? They aren't that cheap. One hundred fifty eight bucks for the Sony Ultra HD home oh, theater streaming. That's a lot. Don't do that. Don't buy that one. But they're all kind of in that price range. Well, if you don't have the discs, you don't need to bother. If you don't have a UHD Blu-ray player, you should just buy the digital on, yeah, you know, yeah. iTunes or whatever, Apple TV app. Hmm. Hmm. I don't. I don't want them to take it away from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the New York Times fired its sports department. And uh, bought the Athletic, and now that's the sports department. And now the New York Times is putting the Athletic on Apple News Plus. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> You're a sport buff, yeah. Is it Athletic's I, good? Is, I like. I good? like it. This is a it, interesting to see Apple rolling some things into the News Plus bundle, uh, adding some value there. And the Athletic's interesting too because it's got a lot of local coverage. The, uh. the original premise was that they had local sports writers, so uh. it, it's not in every market, but like the Bay Area has very good Giants um, 49ers, I do need my Niners coverage. coverage. I need my Niners it's coverage. Really, they they do a good. They got multiple writers on all those topics, and then they've got some national writers who are very good as well. And uh, they're going to add wire cutter as well. And um, for people who don't know, like there's also a bunch of stuff like wire cutter makes you think of consumer reports, which is sort of the old school version of what wire cutter is trying to be. I, I think consumer reports is in there too, because they've got all those magazines that they have their pre previous deals with, but like adding more news content that is behind a paywall and putting it in for, for, you know, as part of your news plus subscription Apple needs to do more of that to make News Plus that much more relevant. I, I mostly go there for the Wall Street Journal articles at this point, right? Because that's yeah. something that's in there is a limited set of Wall Street Journal articles. But if they can come up with a nice curated, a little bit better, nice curated news bundle of premium stuff, then uh, it starts to be a much more interesting service. So Athletic is a great example where there are a lot of people who are like, if you're a fan of of your local sports teams and you've thought about the athletic and you're like, I don't, I just don't want to pay for articles about my local baseball team. You, you know, if you're in news plus, if you've got the Apple one bundle or whatever, you'll just get that content. That's a cool idea. I do have I feel a, like yeah. I get all the Steeler. I, I get all the Steeler news I need on Apple News. <laughs> so I'm just kind of like, I, you know, like there's a Steeler section and I get tons and tons of Steeler. Right. You well, know, and now all that athletic content will be poured into the Steeler section and it's good. Right. I mean, I don't know if the Steelers content on the athletic is good or not, but let's assume that it is and, and you'll get that now. And that's actually, that's one of the clever things about the way they're doing this is if you're a fan of a team and you've got them in Apple News as one of your interest areas, all the athletic content about that team will just go yeah. in there. And it right. immediately increases the quality of the of the favorite team that you're following on Apple uh, News I, Plus. I think the thing that I, it's, it's been hard to crack, and I think I've mentioned it before, is that when all those magazines ended up in Apple News, I really was like, I'm not going to get the paper ones anymore. But I'm finding I'm not converting to the digital ones. Um, and I, I I don't think it's completely connected, but I will say that I hate reading sa serif fonts. I know that they're built so that you can read them. But I'm so used to sans serif that when I see serif fonts, I actually find them more difficult to read and annoying. And mm -hmm. so I will not, I will not read. Like I, as soon as I open something up, like from the New York Times, uh, from uh, what is it, the New Yorker, I think. I'm like, oh, I, I start reading. I get about like I get like two paragraphs in. I'm like, oh, I can't read this. This is very, this is very tiring. I, I find, I actually find 
serif fonts to be tiring to read on my phone. And so that's, that, that's become a huge issue because all these magazines want to use their old serif fonts. And I, I, I find myself not, um, I, I literally, when you get used to reading sans, I know it, it I, I thought it was crazy, but I suddenly realized that I'm really avoiding serif fonts. Like I just, I see them and I won't read them. Helvetica, I, I can read all like the little things. Bit, I just won't read them. Of all the things, but I realized I was like, what bothers me so much about this magazine? And I, and I saw huh. an article by popular mechanics or no, I don't know, popular, somebody, I saw one and I saw it on one webpage with serif and one without, and it was like somebody had re and I realized I was reading the article fine. And then I went to read it in the, in its native format and it was serif. And I suddenly stopped about three, three, three paragraphs in and didn't want to read it anymore. And I was like, and that the only thing different was not the content. It was the actual it's font. It's old fashioned. It, it doesn't, it's not even old fashioned though. It's like literally it just doesn't like, I don't like read. I think it's white on black that I don't like reading it on. Like, you know, it's in <laughs> sure. that thing. So now, I, I will admit I have dyslexia. I have a version of dyslexia that has a problem with blank space, which was diagnosed when I was in college. So was, what do you mean a problem? Like you look at it and it makes you angry. So no, no, no. I, I was diagnosed with a, an issue of reading when I was about 19 that my brain doesn't, um, doesn't make the foreground or the background a back. It doesn't make the background a background. It treats both of them equally. Oh, that's bad. And, um, yeah. And so, so it makes me actually a, a pretty good, uh, it made, made it really good when I was doing, uh, when I do print, print layout for magazines and ads because yeah, you see the white the space, white space yeah. the white space means as much to me as right. the black, as, as the, as all the images and everything. In fact, the white space actually means more to me than the, so it, it was, it turned out to be useful for what I do. Um, but, uh, but it, it made it, it, it's why I listened to a lot of audio books. They, they gave me the ways to fix it so I could read. And I was like, how about I just go to audio books? Yeah. <laughs> so I <laughs> never went back. Yeah. Well, I'm never reading the New York Times again. You've you've spoiled it for me. Thank Sorry, you. I've now I, I, that was what we call a red pill conversation. Oh, I've been red pilled. I'm in red trouble. Pill you, can't, you can't unsee it. Everything's uh, got serif. I mean, our site is serif, isn't it? Maybe not. No, I guess no, it's, it's not. It's all sans serif. I mean, the whole internet is sans serif except for these old magazines. The old stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. there's like old designers will put in some serif stuff. But They'll do serifs on the headlines, but it's not the headlines you're caring right. about. It's the, it's the article. Yeah, the headlines don't bother me at all. Yeah. Like, I don't care. I mean, it, that's fine as, as, as a script, but, but almost everything you see on the internet is sans serif. Margaret Vestager has another trophy for her wall. <laughs> the Adobe Figma deal is up is over uh remember adobe really kind of panicking said we're figma is going to eat our lunch offer them 20 billion dollars probably more than they're worth to acquire them but uh the regulatory uh climate in the eu and the uk pretty much put the kibosh on it and adobe says yeah never mind we're going to give you a billion dollar breakup fee and move go on our way well, it's going to be worse than that, though, for Figma. I mean, the thing is, is that Adobe went, the cheapest route was to was to buy Figma, and that was the easiest one to just solve it. But Adobe needs that product. So the thing so is, is that make you know, it. Figma, you think just so Figma make yeah, it. and the reason I'm sure Figma wanted to sell was because right. Adobe coming, knocking on your door going, hey, we'd like to buy your product means if you we don't buy your product, you know, buy. there's going to be this yeah. grind. And the problem is, is that, you know, you know, Figma is, I mean, it's a standard, you know, so a lot of people are d developing on it. The problem is, is the integration, the, the, you, I don't know exactly who the regulatory folks thought they were protecting, but the users of Figma would have benefited dramatically from the integration with all the Adobe products, you know, like, so, and, and Adobe's um, tools will benefit as they build their own products to go down this path. But I don't think that this wasn't going to be something that hurt the user as much as benefited them. I mean, you may not agree on how much they, you know, now there's this, these different subscription costs and everything else, but, but having being tied into the rest of the Adobe ecosystem would have been very advantageous for, uh, I know, and I know a lot of designers that had Figma, like, oh, Adobe's going to ruin it, but they haven't really ruined a lot of things that they bought. You know, they're not, you know, they, they leave a lot of these companies, like if you look at frame.io, they didn't ruin frame. They didn't right. ruin substance. They made substance way better than it was. It was already an amazing app, but they, you know, the integration with all the tools and then all the generative AI stuff that's happening, you know, it would be great to be able to sit there and do a lot of those things or build interfaces and be able to ask for things and everything else in Figma. And Figma will have a hard time competing with Adobe if Adobe really starts leaning into their market. And so um, it was, I don't, I think that was kind of another, another version of a 
bunch of regulatory folks that don't really know what they're looking at. You know, they're, these are, you know, you know, I, I think that they're, they're making decisions. Of course, it's easy for the Europeans to make decisions because none of these, none of these, none of these companies are theirs. <laughs> yeah. And it's gotta be frustrating for the Figma founders who are looking at a Super. paycheck that was 50 times yeah. its annual revenue, <laughs> double its yeah. last private funding round. Uh, the proposed remedies from the uh, CMA uh, in November, uh, either demanding the divestiture of overlapping operations. <laughs> so, you know, uh, either get rid of Figma design or get rid of Illustrator and Photoshop. Now that's Adobe said, well, what? We're <laughs> that's <laughs> makes no. <laughs> uh, so they just said, you know, look, we can't work with these guys. Uh, and uh, that's that. Now, I, I'm surprised they didn't contest it in some other way, but I guess they just wanted to drag on. Hmm. I just, I mean, I don't know. You've got a big company that dominates its market, and you've got a competitor who's an upstart who's coming in and kind of eating the lunch of the big of the big company and taking its customers and doing new things with them. It uh, kind of feels like that it's deeply anti-competitive to let them just use their money <laughs> to buy them out, right? Like they should probably. So, so, like, I hear what Alex is saying, but I don't know. It just seems wrong that a any big company with deep pockets can find a competitor that's built something that finds a weakness in their corporate structure and just decides to take them out. Or take them in. In this case, I don't but know. I mean, I maybe guess, Figma I guess the is question is, is who who are they hurting? Like, I mean, I just so is it the founders because the founders are about to have, just gave up on a huge the customers. Project. It would be for the, the customers, customers because because the it's going to get sucked. In, there's not going to be competition, and instead, yeah. Adobe's just going to suck Figma in but, and make different decisions because Adobe is Adobe and they've got existing products, whereas Figma didn't care. Uh, if they overlapped some of Adobe's products because they were trying to get new customers. Yeah, but the question is, I mean, can if, if Adobe focuses the Adobe eye on what Figma's doing, like really focus on it, does Figma start to lose, you know, can Figma c compete with that because there's all this integration of all these other apps that uh, that Adobe's going to bring to bear? I'm just not sure that down the road that Figma benefits from it. I don't think, I think that the users would have benefited from the integration with all the Adobe products. Like that's the thing that, that is, you know, and I think that, um, you know, Figma is, a, you know, it, it's doing well. I, I think that, I, I think Adobe honestly wanted to buy them before somebody else does. I mean, because for a lot of these companies, that's their exit strategy is getting bought. They're not, they don't want to go public. I mean, nobody, I mean, most people don't want to go public anymore because it's too complicated. Um, and so, so getting bought is, was probably the model that, that the EU just took away. And again, I think that we really need to rethink whether company countries should be able to regulate companies that don't exist <laughs> that aren't in their country. Like so, you know, like because well, the, the whole Europe, Europe, the EU can make all these things because none of these companies are European companies. So what you know, you're saying like, is that the the problem here is that Figma built a whole audience of people who did want to do things differently from Adobe, but since Figma wanted to just sell them back to Adobe, we should let them do that. I just I don't know. It, it no. I, like legal things aside, it just seems striking. I mean, it's fundamentally anti-competitive. It is a an Adobe competitor with a competitive product that's mm -hmm. scary. Adobe and so Adobe wanted to buy them and take them off the market and I do not have any sympathy for the founders and investors in Figma that is not where my sympathy lies I have very little sympathy for anybody whose entire strategy is we'll build up a thing and then sell it off to the highest bidder instead of trying to build a company and uh, you know I don't think it's an argument that like Adobe bought them because they were afraid that somebody else would buy them like would that be a competitor would they build a competitive product that would force Adobe to work harder and have competition in the market I'm for that I, I think that's I a guess, better idea but I guess as, as a user though the user is going to not benefit from the integration that is that is great. Adobe will do some integration, but they're not going to give up a lot of their a lot of what they would have done. Where they there's a lot of technology that Adobe has, and that's what they're looking at with Figma that they're going that they would have infused into the into the thing, and it would have made it a much better app, you know, for probably about the same price, you know, and. And so, you know, I guess, I mean, I, I just, I'm, I think sometimes we, we can look at anti-competitiveness from a, from a theoretical perspective, but I feel like we really need to decide like, 
who is getting hurt by yeah, it. But your statement that it's well, a much better this. app, I think, assumes a lot, right? Because I think there's a lot of stuff that wasn't invented at Adobe that they're gonna that they would have pulled out of Figma oh, and no, said, no, 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 we'll do it our way instead. And the customers uh, who preferred Figma will not benefit from having it done the Adobe way. But you know, we'll we'll never. We'll never know now. Yeah. I, I, I do think it's more of a case of it, it's I, I appreciate the argument that you ask who does it hurt. But sometimes when you talk about entire markets, you, you're talking about raising the temperature of the environment by one quarter of one degree. That by degrees, the more that companies that are huge and have a lot of power get to consolidate power, the closer they get to a place where they don't have to take any answers or any guff from anybody. And it's not, it's, and we're seeing this in the, uh, in the communication space, like a long time ago, where deregulation didn't create an open, more free market of speech. It basically meant that now the, at the, at the point where now uh, companies could own radio stations, TV stations, newspapers, and multiple markets. Now you have single corporations that own most of the media uh, in, in, in the entire country and can therefore steer communications to exactly where they want to go. And each one of those individual sales was probably good for the shareholders of whatever individual newspaper or media group sold out uh, to the larger conglomerate. But again, quarter of a degree at a time, quarter of a degree at a time. And now these companies are in such a strong position where they really can't be told anything. And it does take the the regulatory smackdown to get them to not just do whatever is in strictly their own immediate best interests. Well, so speaking seeing, of regulatory seeing, smackdowns, uh, Google has now agreed uh, this. Remember, they lost in court, but there was also an action going on uh, against them in the United States by a, a group of uh, a state's attorneys general, Google has settled. They've agreed to pay $700 million in the Play Store settlement. Uh, and they're going to make some changes to their app store. Developers will be able to use an alternative billing system in Google Play's billing option. Uh, Alphabet will simplify the process of downloading apps from the website, sideloading, and they won't put that uh, ugly, scary <laughs> message <laughs> on uh, as much anymore. So this isn't what Epic exactly wanted. They wanted, of course, I think they want to have their own store. Uh, Alphabet is tra challenging that Epic verdict, but they have had to uh, settle with uh, 36 states and the D and District of Columbia. Um, so that's a big deal. And I mentioned, and I know it's an Apple show because Apple is kind of under the same scrutiny. It looks like they're going to have yeah. to do something in the EU as early as this summer. Yeah, and, and, and it also ties in with uh, another announcement where Apple decided that, hey, developers, we're going to offer you a new way in the App Store that you can start to bundle their, your subscriptions together, or excuse, or excuse me, or at least uh, if you have multiple uh, subscription-based apps, if you can allow people to, hey, if you're already subscribed to one of our apps, we'll give you a discount on, our, uh, on, a, on a different app. They call it contingent app. pricing. Contingent pricing and making it clear that, hey, we'll handle all the back end. You really don't have to do much of anything to take advantage of this. You can advertise this on your own sites, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not something that I think Apple would have done on its own, if not for the fact that there is this thing coming where they don't know whether they're going to have to have to deal. They're going to have to deal with uh, the possibility of competing app stores. Now, I, I don't think that uh having uh, having an equivalent app store experience uh, where you go to either go to the official app store apple app store for all my apps or there's another one just like there's a target versus walmart where you can get the exact same apps in a different configuration i don't think that's necessarily a good thing but now apple's realizing that for some businesses it's going to definitely make sense for them to say hey just just download the adobe app or just download the fortnite app, the, the epic games app and handle all of our, our all the purchases through there there uh, from there on and now they're in a position where they have to say we have to make sure that we're making our app store experience as attractive as profitable uh, we have to be responsive to developers things that they've been asking for for a long long time like having uh, more open lines developers having more open lines of communications with their uh, uh, with their customers the ability to again uh, turn Apple's uh, App Store customers into their software customers, not just uh, Apple iPhone customers. All this sort of stuff is now on the table because Apple now feels that they're going to have to start competing for business instead of simply saying, this is the only place you can sell. Uh, if you're an Apple, uh, if, you're an, if you're an iPhone developer, this is the only place you can sell this. You sell your stuff. We run the store, so we make the rules. If you don't like it, go see how much fun you have writing, writing apps for, for the BlackBerry because there's no alternative. If you have uh, wondered, as I have, 
What happens to family sharing when many, many subscription apps cannot be shared? Apparently, Apple was sued over this in 2019, saying they misrepresented the ability to use family sharing to share subscriptions, and they have now agreed to settle uh, the class action lawsuit, paying out $25 million, almost all of which will undoubtedly go to the attorneys, and denying all allegations of wrongdoing. But I have to say, I it is, you know, you think, oh, I can share all my apps. And really, there's a very limited number of apps you can share that way. Uh, anybody who, any U.S. resident who uh, was in a family sharing group with at least one other person between June 2015 and January 2019 and purchased a subscription to an app from the App Store may be eligible for a payment. You'll be getting, if you're in the class, you'll be getting an email uh, this week. As much as $30. Uh, the payment will not exceed $50 for each class member. And yes, $10 million of the settlement will go to the attorneys. Well, it's not quite half. Those are always the biggest yeah. winners. The attorneys on class action suits That's are always they do the big winners. Everybody else gets $10 yeah. or $5 or 50 yeah. cents. Or yeah. here's, a, here's a candy kid. Get, Bag get of out pop of here, chips. So. Yeah, these and, are all. And Peter the, Russell the, Clark, who is one of the last senior industrial designers from the Johnny Ive era, has uh, stepped down to spend more time with his money after <laughs> 20 years at the company. He was a hardware a designer, and he worked on the headquarters and retail stores. Now it's going to be designing space hotels. Oh, yeah, vast. That's interesting. It, it's a space <laughs> hotel company? Wow. Yeah, they, they're, if you go to their website, they're, trying, they're, they're basically designing uh, uh, commercial space stations basically for tourism with artificial gravity of some sort through you know through spinning the thing around and so they hired him to start up an industrial design uh, division within that company because that's if you're, you're you got people who are going to be <laughs> who are going to be vomiting they got people who well, are going to have to deal with here's like, some good news i can re re reserve my uh, my stay already well this yeah. looks a lot like the spacex uh rocket they're 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 using yeah, they're using oh, SpaceX Falcon the for, uh, for, tra for transport over oh. there. Right? I'm sorry, dragons up for, to uh, Haven for One for thirty days above aboard the world's first private space station, scheduled to launch no earlier than August 2025. Huh? So <laughs> they're going to give you a ride in the SpaceX Dragon up to their Haven One space hotel. Well, that's interesting. I, I can't yeah, imagine they're going to make money on this. What, what, how, much, how, much, how much does it cost? I, I want to reserve my stay. How much, how much is it going to, <laughs> how much is it going to cost me? How much is it going to say? Oh, you just have to email them for details and pricing information. That's one way of yeah. saying if you have to ask, you can't afford it, Leo. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. That's that, funny. that must be a fun challenge for a natural designer. Sure. Sure. Especially if you have more money than God and you don't have to really work for a living. You can, you know, draw pictures of space stations. Seems how do you like how do you design a, a bracket for a hairdryer or toothbrush holder in the hotel bathroom if the hotel is in space? That's something that he never got to really figure out at Apple. You know, we we we're so used to the idea of you know, like in two thousand one, rotating space stations that have artificial gravity gravity through centrifugal force. That we've never built one of those. You know, that's just made up. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I guess. It might be just fun to float around. Maybe you just want to <laughs> yeah, float I mean, around. There's some problems. Have there's space problems sex. For your bones. Sure. There's some problems uh, uh, with, uh, for your bones. Yeah, don't stay and, there and too long. Your eyes are going to distend. And but, but hanging out up there for a little while, a little I, I, I wouldn't mind That's being waiting for uh, a week or two or a month. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll have them email you, Jet, then. How about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. <laughs> Alex is ready to go. All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, and your final picks of 2023. So make them good. Jason Snell, Alex Lindsay, Andy, yes, and Arco. Make them good. Our show today brought to you by Secure My Email. I, for a long time, I've talked about uh, using PGP or GPG to secure uh, email. And, and I have, I think, uh, literally, the number of people who've done it, are, I can count on the fingers of one hand. I get emails every few years. Hey, it's, is it working? It's so crazy. It's so hard to do. And yet, people I know, people want private email. Well, Secure My Email is the email encryption service we've all been waiting for because it's easy. We use email for so much, right? 
personal and business communication. But sending emails like sending a postcard, if it's not encrypted, everybody can read it. It really lacks the security and privacy you may be craving. Encryption solves this problem, but as I had mentioned, it's hard to do. It's complicated. Um, PGP and S-MIME, which I've, I, you know, I've set up and I wouldn't recommend it to my worst enemy. They're antiquated. They're complicated. They're cumbersome. One user at a time, and then you got to exchange your keys and et cetera, et cetera. Secure My Email allows you to enjoy the simplicity and utility of email. Encryption. Modern, private, secure encryption. They, in fact, use OpenPGP and the ChaCha20 cipher suite to encrypt your email. Both very good. Steve Gibson recommended cipher suites. Uh, it works on all your devices, Mac, Windows, Android, iOS. By the way, uh, if you're an attorney or a physician, you'll be glad to know it also makes your email fully HIPAA and GDPR compliant. I always laugh when I get emails from uh, attorneys with a signature block that says, if, you, if you, this is not for you, don't read this. <laughs> you may not read this. Uh, how, about, how about encryption? That's the way to do it. And you don't, here's the thing. With Secure My Email, you don't have to change anything. You can encrypt your current email addresses, both personal and business. So you don't have to get a new email address. You don't have to get a new email provider. You are welcome to use Secure My Email's apps to manage your email, but you can also keep using your current setup. And just use Secure My Email when you need to. It's super easy to set up and use. All the encryption is hidden below the below the fold, behind the hood. Your recipients, by the way, this is important, don't have to be using Secure My Email. Nor do they have to register for it. Nor do they have to know passwords. That That's a big deal. A lot easier than PGP or SMI. And even ProtonMail requires an out-of-band password for non-user recipients. When recipients respond, their emails and attachments automatically encrypted through the Secure My Email systems. Secure My Email's free forever plan, this might be interesting to you, lets you encrypt a single consumer email address from Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft, and more for free, forever. Instant download and activation. You don't have to give them payment info. No registration, no call is required. If you decide you like this and you want to use it with more addresses, up to eight addresses, business or personal, it's only $3.99 a month or $29.99 a year. This is a whole heck of a lot easier. Start your free account or enjoy a 30-day free trial of a premium plan. No payment info required. And they have a special offer for Twit listeners. So go to securemyemail.com slash twit. Securemyemail.com slash twit. Use the offer code twit at checkout. Secu this is such a good idea. Securemyemail.com slash twit. Twit. The offer code is also Twit. Thank you, Secure My Email, for supporting Mac Break Weekly. And now, ladies and gentlemen, blah, drum roll, please. The last picks of the year. Jason Snell. Yeah, I'm going to do a website pick, but it is from somebody in the Apple community, Zach Gage, who has developed some incredible oh, he's got, iOS games. Yes. Kind of a genius, really bad chess, spell tower, type shift, not words, many others. Um, he was part of a startup that created a website called Puzmo that sold to Hearst newspapers, actually. It is a great website. You don't have to read a Hearst newspaper to get that. But the idea here is Hearst wants a little bit of that, what the New York Times uh, puzzles have. So Puzmo is a new page. You can play some games for free. You can also become a subscriber. If you're a subscriber to the San Francisco Chronicle or the Houston Chronicle, the Hearst newspapers, you can um, get a discount on it. And uh, But they're games to play for free as well. It's all web-based and it includes several Zach Gage games uh, like Spell Tower, Really Bad Chess, and Type Shift along with um, some new stuff including a really nice crossword that is uh, I think that a lot of people would like because it's not quite as hard as some of the really tough crosswords that are out there in various newspapers. It's just really beautifully done. It all happens inside your web browser. Um, and I just, Zach is great at what he does. And this whole team has built what they are viewing as sort of like the newspaper puzzle page of the internet. And they got, uh, you know, they got Hearst to be involved as an investor and, um, and you know, puzzles. Turns out people like to do puzzles on the Internet. The New York Times has made a lot of money doing that. And now here's an alternative that you can sign up for 
uh, called Puzmo, and it's really good. It's really well done. I'm doing terrible at it so far. <laughs> okay. For those who haven't played the Zach Gage games, they're so clever. Like, really bad chess is brilliant. It's literally just chess, but you're given a random assortment of pieces, and you have to play with them. <laughs> Uh, like, oh, you've got three queens and a bishop, and that's it. And, you know, and a king and a, and a pawn. And so does the other side, and you have to, you know, try to beat them using this weird assortment of pieces. And there are a lot of word games that he does. Like, he's just, the, his apps are great. A lot of them are in um, Apple Arcade. Actually, if you're in there, you can get a lot of uh, Zach's games for free. But now Puzmo is here with daily puzzles. It's really well done. Uh, nice. Couldn't recommend it more. Nice. I'm having fun. Okay, I'm still wrong, but, I, but I'm having fun. All right, P-U-Z-Z-M-O. Yep, Puzmo. Puzmo. Mr. Andy Anako. Mine is an easy holiday pick. Ella wishes you a swinging Christmas. Not, oh. every, not all of us celebrate Christmas, but we should all be celebrating uh, Ella Fitzgerald. For sure. And this is yeah. this is my favorite Christmas album of all time. Mo most of them are Christmas songs, but, most of them, but the, the rest of them are just... January and December sort of songs. If, and who knew that you could make Jingle brilliant. Bells a great song? That's, you know. It swings, man. It's swinging. <laughs> the, the title, yeah. it does what it says on the jingle label. Bell, jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. Yeah, it's awesome. Swinging. I love this. You've given us some very good uh, recommendations, not just for the holidays. But uh, this is a good I can, one. You know, the, 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 number of, the amount of feedback I get every year about, oh, I'm not listening to so-and-so. And, -so and, uh, and Anaka recommended to me like two or three years ago, like, oh, great. I'm so glad. Well, you can mention the a, Christmas every, every, Carol again. That's a, that's a mm -hmm. perennial favorite. Yep, I think I think I I think I did that like the very first uh, for, very first show after Thanksgiving, the Patrick Stewart Christmas Carol on Audible. Yeah, uh, which you can buy pretty much anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. it's I've, I've I've owned that for so long. I bought it on cassette <laughs> <laughs> for the first time back when he was still John Luke Picard. I think. Wow, that's awesome. It's the first time he was John Luke Picard. Very nice. Happy holidays. Uh, I didn't Thank say you, it to Jason, too. but happy holidays to you both. Alex, Thank your you. pick of the week. How much money am I gonna? Be a lot, a lot, <laughs> <laughs> like a lot, like this one. This was not, yeah. This a is lot. so. I, I, I don't Ooh. think I, I, I look through the Mac break picks, and I don't think I've, I don't think Ooh. I've recommended this in the past. And this I think it's mostly because need, it costs a lot. Yeah, it's. I'm sorry for being expensive, but this is expensive and it's amazing. Um, so I realized I, so I've been using this for a couple of years, probably two or three years, and I think I've hesitated on recommending this one because it's expensive. It's a thousand dollars. You can get cheaper ones. Um, so there's other ones. What this is, is a, it's a pretty high tech mic mute. Um, and so it has, um, you know, a thousand dollar mic mute kids. Yeah. So there's a couple things about it. Number one is, is so you can get ones by, uh, you know, a variety of folks that have little clickers that will actively, you know, pull it mechanically. But the problem is, is that when it's sitting next to your mic, you can hear me clicking. Yes. You hear click, you hear click, you hear click. Yes. Or when you cut it, you hear the cut, you know, you hear the electronic cut. Right. You never hear it. And, and this is studio technologies is pretty much any major studio that you walk into, uh, you know, you see these all over the place, you know, and this is, they have lots of different versions. They have a interpreter version, they have smaller versions, bigger versions, but this one is the one that I use. This is, this is what sits on my desk. Um, and I, again, you, I use it every day, all day because I'm constantly muting my mic. I don't want to figure out where the software thing is for my zoom. Um, I'm not trying to figure out, okay, what, what, whether the zoom is in front or back, I just have a hardware mute. And this one, one of the things that's distinct is the two little buttons that you see next to it. Those are talkbacks. And so if I'm in comms, if I have comms on my computer like Unity or Clear Comms, uh, Agent IC, I push that button. So I'm going to push one of those buttons while I just disappeared. Because what it does is it allows me to talk back to, uh, into my comms without actually, it automatically mutes me from the main feed back to the, to what I'm doing. And so for radio and TV and so on and so forth, you want, and, they, and again, I've owned studio technology stuff for many, many years. Uh, they're part of the, what I consider the Wisconsin audio mafia. There's so <laughs> many companies out of, out of Madison that do audio. It's very odd, but, but it's, um, you know, sound devices, studio technologies, um, uh, audio implements, all these are all in one place. Anyway. So, um, uh, anyway, it's a good, it's a good thing. I've been using it for years. And the big thing is I, my hand sits on top of it all the time i want to like instead of instead of you hear me do this or something like that i 
Yeah. It's mute. Yeah. And it's, and it doesn't make any noise. And again, it's, it's got Dante. I can do a lot. There's like a little app to, to run it, you know, so there's, there's a lot to it. So it, it's not for everybody, but it is a, and, and it's, you know, again, it's, it does both analog in and out, but also Dante in and out. Um, so and that's what part of what makes it so expensive. The Dante license is expensive to put into, into these, these little things. They make analog versions of these as well. Um, but, uh, but anyway, this is the one that, that I've been using for years. And I, I realized that I probably should go ahead and I can go ahead and recommend if it. If I were going to set up a home <laughs> studio, should I do Dante everywhere? Or is that really more for a bigger studio? I use it in mine. I mean, I have, so I have this inside of Dante. I have, um, my computers are all on Dante virtual. They're a Dante virtual um, sound card. Mm -hmm. So if I want to send audio from, because I've got- And is it over your regular home network or do you have a dedicated network? No, I just have it on my regular one. I mean, I'm not, when I build, when I do productions, the Dante's on it, at least its own VLAN, then oftentimes its own copper. You can get, if you're going to do Dante VLAN, I have a Ubiquiti. I can set up a Dante VLAN. and if you really, the easiest way to do Dante and NDI and other things like that is Net, Net, Netgear makes a thing called a 4250, which is a, they've a, it's a 4250 line and it's got, it, it automatically builds all the things you need to manage your Dante and, mm-hmm. and NDI networks. It's a, it's a media switch, right? So, so that's, if you're really, I'm, I'm thinking about getting one of those, but I just, right now it's working, but on my, I have about six computers on my, la, on my desk and they're all intertwined audio wise via Dante and loopback. So loopback is serving those things up to people. And then Dante is passing it between the computers and you have a Dante controller and you kind of click through all that stuff. So anyway, so, um, so the, I buy a lot of stuff wanting it to work on Dante. <laughs> so, because it's, uh, cause I, yeah, I, I think if I were going to set up a studio at home, which I won't for, and if you want to deliver, the great thing is you want to deliver audio to your, um, from anything right. to your speakers, you, right. there's these little analog things that go in with an ethernet cable. So oh. Audinate makes these little, um, tails. So you throw those in, like if I want to do surround, like in my office, when I had surround in the, the last office that I was, that I was doing reviews in. I have all of those speakers are getting Ethernet all the way to the last six inches, and they they go into these little tails oh, that so go cool. in that, that become yeah. analog. But now I can send any audio from any device into the to any of those speakers and just you know configure them as needed. So yeah, Very that's nice. a whole other Very pick nice. somewhere. But anyway, yes. But the studio technology. I'm gonna have you come to my house cool. is what I'm gonna do, and I'll give sure. you eggnog, yeah. and then yeah. you'll tell me everything. <laughs> Happy to do it. I, I work for eggnog. <laughs> Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, we actually have, I have a similar thing uh, for our uh, Axios system. It yeah. costs $1,100. So yeah, this is a deal. It's a, it's a, and this one works with all kinds of things. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's, I use the analog side of it because I'm taking this and going to do a mix pre. So I use the analog side to go to, for my main mic, but my talkback mics, if I choose to use them, are over Dante. So if I press the TB... Talk back button, John. Will it go to John Ashley? And it'll mute, you. And it'll mute me. So same thing. Yep. Ashley, and now it's unmuted me. Yep. You're talking to me, but they don't hear? Let's see. Look at that. The power Whoa. comes. Oh, <laughs> but I can't hear myself when you're talking. Can they hear me when you're talking? So they can't hear you, but can they hear me when you're talking? Because it mutes me in my headphones. Okay. And when, what does this button do? Yeah, the tell us to push that button. <laughs> no. What does this do? Famous oh, last no. words. I wish you could see it because there's a clock in it with a thing and a face and a timer. Leo, you've been told don't push that button specifically. And there's a button that says <laughs> Uber 1 and Uber 2. The- I don't know what that's for. Oh, user 1 and user 2. Well, it's so tiny. The, 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 proper, the proper thing to say is I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. I am that Groot. is the button that'll kill everyone. And uh, it, what's really disappointing is it has headphone a headphone knob and even shows the DB and everything, but it's not connected to anything. So, eleven hundred bucks. Get the do yourself a favor. Get the Studio Technologies Model Two Hundred Five that Alex a mere nine ninety five. See, it's <laughs> uh, saved me a hundred bucks. Alex Lindsay is at officehours.global. What are you doing for the holidays at Office Hours? More, more, more shows. stuff. Uh, so the, the week bef- between the end of the year, a lot of times, so it's a little bit of a retrospective. So we'll look back at the shows that we liked, like what, what worked well. And then we'll look forward. Like, what would we like to see more of? Uh, Who would we like to bring on? Who would we, so the, all next week is kind of a little bit of a, of a retrospective as well as a kind of a look forward as oh, we kind fun. of plan to, 
to go through. Yeah. So we had a, and we're, you know, we, we've been playing around. We did uh, Monday. We had, uh, we did a thing on pre- presentations and keynote. We talked a little bit about some of the tips and tricks of what we do. And today, Alex Golner, another, I think we talked about him last week. We, we've been having this little, like every week talking a little bit about Apple motion and, uh, oh, yeah. man, oh, yeah. it's some mind blowing things in Apple motion today. Like I, I, I've been using Apple motion since the first version and there was a whole bunch of things that I didn't no, it could Amazing. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's good. It was good. Officehours.global. It's open to all. You can even join the Zoom call uh, early in the AM here on the West Coast or watch on YouTube. But it all starts with the website, officehours.global. Uh, of course, Alex also produces a show for Michael Krasny called Gray Matter. And uh, Jason was on it last week. Do you have a big guest this week as well? Uh, yeah, we um, we, you know. We've got guests every week. Oh, how to um, age but, gracefully. <laughs> this one's for me. Yeah. This, so it's interesting. Ken Dykewall, um, we had on last uh, last Friday and live, and he's and we just released this one. You know, you you look at this. This is like um, um, This American Life. You look at the subject and you go, I don't know if I really need to watch that. Wow, what a great interview. Yeah. Like he just, he's been really, he's been thinking about this for the last 30, 40 years and the things he's, you know, talking about and how it affects the economy oh, and how and this. how we have to think I mean, about how to right. integrate things and how yeah. we have to think about these things. It's it's actually, it turned out to be, um, again, it was, uh, um, it was, it wasn't something that I expected, I mean, I expected it to be good because every person that we've, we've brought on has been really good, but, but I, I, it was much more thought provoking than I expected. And, and even, you know, I, it's not something, aging isn't something, I, probably something I should be thinking about, but I don't. Um, you will soon and, enough. Don't worry. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so, no but, but I, I really, it just had me thinking about like how you build communities around that. Cause there's a huge percentage of people that are, you know, um, there's a, we're kind of top heavy in the United States where there's a huge percent of people going into these, you know, how do you build um yeah what do they call it age age uh, aware cities and oh, yeah. housing and yeah. everything else it's really interesting i will be absolutely listening to this one as well as yeah. the one featuring andy and the one featuring jason and i won't listen to the one featuring me because i i was there <laughs> uh that's a great matter show and of course if you want to hire alex zero nine zero dot media andy and Otko. You're going to do GBH between now and Christmas, or are you going to take a couple of weeks off? Yep, I'm on Thursday at 12.35 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to WGBHnews.org to listen to it live or later. Then I've got next week off. Awesome. As do all of us, next week's Mac Break Weekly will be a best of episode, but we'll reconvene January 2nd. Jason Snell, you're going to Phoenix in between now That's and then right. to be with the folks. Right, drinking the rays, Aww, drinking the sun. Get some sun. <laughs> you won't be able to wear your mithril sweater there, unfortunately. That's but. okay. It'll be too hot. Too hot. <laughs> uh, Jason is at sixcolors.com where he files. He'll even be filing from Arizona, I have a feeling. Probably. He files maybe. all the time. He also does it's many different. podcasts, which you can find out about at sixcolors.com slash Jason Mm-hmm. Do you have holiday episodes of your shows? Yeah, I, I have spent the last few days banking lots of holiday episodes oh, of various podcasts of Upgrade and the Incomparable and the rest, and they're all going to come out while I'm while I'm gone, and nice. that's fine. Nice. And you had your Upgradies last week on the Upgrade. Yeah, we, you know, our awards that we just make up. That's, that's <laughs> happening. And we'll have a, I mean, it's not much of a process. We just... Up, we just choose who the winners are, and that's it. Like, it's not that hard. There's just two of us, so. Better than the People Dundies, like the Upgradies. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Thank Happy you. holidays Happy to holidays, you, Andy. Everybody. You get to celebrate Christmas yeah. twice, you lucky guy. I hope you have a Perugies wonderful Pierogies the home. second time. Pierogies and, <laughs> and cold I love pierogies. I love mm. pierogies. Uh, we'll have a wonderful uh, holiday, and we'll see you January 2nd. You too, Alex. You're going to spend time with the kids? You going I somewhere? Am. Yeah. Not going anywhere. Nice. <laughs> I'm not. I might, might, might not even make it to the garage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just watch a lot of movies on DVD. Mm. Or something. DVD, I don't know. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the DVD player, honey? It's in the attic where you put it five years ago. Oh. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, Festivus is coming up in just a couple of days. Get your uh, aluminum pole ready for the airing of grievances <laughs> and the feats of strength. Then there'll be Christmas Eve, Sunday night. We have a very special 
best of twit. It's not a like best of on Sunday night. It's kind of the old farts twit featuring the older denizens. None of you guys. You're all too young. You have to be over 60 to be in this one. But uh, but it was a lot of fun. I was joined with Steve by Steve Gibson, Doc Searles, Jeff Jarvis, Rod Pyle. We talked, we, gave, we contextualized the year behind us and uh, what is coming up. Chaos, I think, was the word of the show. But you'll find out more when you listen on uh, Christmas Eve. And then we'll be back January 2nd. Uh, New Year's Eve for a Twit will be a, a best of uh, show. We have best ofs, as I said, all week long next week from all of our shows, or most of our shows, including this one. So have a happy holiday, everybody. Thank you for joining us on episode 900. Onward to 1,000. But now I'm sorry to say it's time to get back to work because break time is over. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs seven bucks a month, or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.